go ahead and take your seat. Judge, uh, I've already asked, but uh, you told me we were ready to bring the jury in, right? Okay. As we're getting them ready, um, Ms. Edwards, you said all day today and all day tomorrow. That I leaves. Say all day tomorrow, but I said some tomorrow, all day tomorrow. All right, I misheard you then. Okay, we ready? Let's bring them in, please. <laughs> no, it's okay. You mean tomorrow? Okay. I was assuming we don't go past lunch tomorrow. How much time do you think the defense is going to need? We know Mr. Uh, Rudolph is going to be testifying. What else you got? Three witnesses, possibly four. In addition to Mr. Rudolph. Is that what you're saying? No, two. Mr. Rudolph four, four, plus? Two more. Two okay. three more. Okay. And maybe some officers who come in who they call rebuttal witnesses. So you don't really know? Is that what you're telling me? Well, I don't know who they're calling on 13 witnesses. I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> For sure, I can tell you I have three witnesses, maybe four. Okay. We have to push this trial, folks. We've got to move it. Jury entering. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Go ahead and take your seats, please. Okay, let's bring uh, the witness back in. I've forgotten her name. Miss Brunt, was it? Or Brant. Sorry, Miss Brant. Yes. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You may continue on direct examination. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Yes, sir. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good. All right. Where we left off yesterday were various photos uh, that you took at that first scene that you responded to at 4015. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Now, do you recall when you were speaking about copper fragments that you located throughout the vehicle? Yes. And when you saw those metal fragments, did you take them uh, into evidence and bag them up so that they could be preserved for later? Yes. Would you be able to recognize uh, the evidence bags that you put those in if I showed them to you? Yes. Judge, permission to approach? You may. It's going to be states 15 and 16. Good. No, no objection. Thank you. I remember you said that yesterday. To basically everything on the table, right? Except the class, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Showing you number 15. Can you tell the jury what we're looking at there? It's an uh, evidence bag that I completed uh, that contains uh, copper fragments and a silver fragment. Okay. 
And on that evidence bag, do you indicate all the different places where you've located those different fragments? Yes. Okay. State seeks to submit Exhibit 15, Judge. All right. Submitted without objection. Thank you. And I'm going to show you number 16. If you could do the same thing, if you look at that, do you recognize that one? I do. What is that bag in number 16? <clears throat> it's an evidence bag I prepared uh, that contains fragments as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, did one of the jurors? Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. you can go ahead and continue. Thank you for bringing that to our, my attention. All right, go ahead. The evidence bag I completed that contains fragments recovered from the Cadillac. Okay. Um, Judge State seeks to admit Exhibit 16. It's admitted without objection. Now, do you also recall uh, the pictures about the phone that was in the front right passenger kind of door panel there? Yes. Did you also take that phone into evidence? I did. It went back and forth from me to Herzog to Vanderlyn and then back to me, but ultimately I placed it into evidence. Okay. And would you recognize that if I showed it to you? Yes. May I approach with State 26? You could take a look at that one, and we could tell the jury what state's 26 is. It's the evidence bag that I prepared that contains the cell phone from the door panel pocket in the right front passenger quadrant of the Cadillac. Okay, great. State seeks to admit state's 26. Admitted without objection. <clears throat> Now, once you take all of those different photographs and take certain pieces of evidence in, did there come a point in time where a representative from the medical examiner's office arrives on scene as well? Yes. Okay, and during that point in time, does that individual also take photographs of the deceased in this case? Yes. Okay. And were you present for that? Yes. And when you're allowing the medical examiner's investigator to do his work, uh, is either you or him taking out anything that may have been in the victim's pockets, the deceased yes. pockets. Okay. And you were present for that as well? Yes. And do you recall the photograph um, where the deceased on his pants, there were a pair of car keys? Yes. Okay. Where were those car keys located? In his right front pants pocket. Okay. And did you take those keys into evidence as well? I did. Okay. Permission to approach, Judge? You may. <clears throat> It's 27. You can take a look at that and do you recognize it? I do. What is that? The evidence bag I prepared for the keys that were recovered from the victim's right front pants pocket. Okay. State seeks to admit 27, Judge. It's admitted without objection. And as I stated, uh, does the medical examiner's investigator also take photographs separately from all the photographs you take? Yes. Okay. Permission to approach with states 28, Judge? You may. This is going to be a composited exhibit A through F. Thank you. You could take a look at these right here. <clears throat> Start with that top one. Do you recognize that? Yeah. Can you tell the jury what that photograph is? That's the dorsal side or the top side of the victim's right hand. Okay. And is this photograph taken once he's removed from the vehicle and prepared basically for the medical examiner to start doing their work? Yes. Okay. And so underneath, underneath the deceased on this, what's underneath him? Uh, the body bag. Okay. And then a white sheet. Okay, if you could turn to B, what are we looking at here? This is the Palmer side of the victim's right hand. Okay, if you could turn to C, what are we looking at there? This is the decedent's right hand in a bag. Okay, what's the purpose of the bag? That's to um, maintain any trace evidence that might be present because in the post-mortem process, uh, the autopsy process, 
there are nail clippings taken by the medical staff at the ME. So any evidence that may be derivative from that is captured in this bag and not lost from banging around in the bag. Got it. If you could turn to D. Now what are we looking at in D? This is the dorsal side of the victim's right hand. Is this his right hand or his left hand? <clears throat> Sorry. No, it's a little disorienting. Yeah. Sorry, left hand. Okay. If you go to E, what are we looking at here? This is the Palmer side of the victim's left hand. Okay. And then the last photo, F, what are we looking at here? And this is a photo of the victim's left hand with the bag having been placed over it. For the same purpose as we discussed before. Yes. Okay. Judge, at this point, state would seek to admit 28A <clears throat> through F. Admitted without objection. Okay, now in terms of the Cadillac, where does the Cadillac go from the scene at 4015 Broadway? Where is it brought? It's towed from the scene to our crime scene garage, which is located at our office on Gun Club Road. Okay, and I know we're probably jumping forward in time, but did there come a point in time where you went back to the Cadillac to take even more photos at that location? Yes. Okay, and what's the purpose of that? That's to fully document the vehicle in a controlled environment that wasn't able to be done on scene. Okay. Now, in terms of on scene, did you get a chance while you were on scene to search the trunk of that vehicle at that point in time? No. Did there come a point in time where you were able to open the trunk and <clears throat> see what was inside? Yes. Okay. You may. I do. What are those photographs of? Uh, this is the interior trunk of the Cadillac. Okay. Judge, state seeks to admit 39A through U. Admitted without objection. Permission to publish, Judge? Thank you. All right. So we're going to look at A right now. What are we looking at here? This is the interior trunk space of the Cadillac. Okay. Was this when it was just open during your investigation? Correct. Well, later in the garage. In the garage. Yeah. Okay. This is B. What are we looking at here? This is part of the contents that we observed in the trunk space. Okay. Here's there. Thank you. If you need to, you can stand up and adjust your view if you need. <clears throat> All right. Like I said, this is letter C. What are we looking at here? This is an overall view of the contents of the trunk. Some items were removed um, after the initial photograph was taken to show what was underneath some top items. Looking at D, what do we see here? That's another view of the contents of the water bottle and a black satchel. Okay. Now, in terms of those photographs, was there anything else other than those items that we saw that were in the back of that trunk? No, not that's photographed. Okay. What are we looking at here, if you can tell, on E? That's a cell phone that was in the trunk, and it was laying just forward of that black satchel. So it wasn't inside of the black satchel? Correct. Okay. What about this one here? This is that same cell phone in its, uh, the back cover in its case. Okay. Same thing here we're looking at? Same cell phone, but uh, the back of it uh, with the case removed. Got it. And that one was G.
What about H? What are we looking at here? Same cell phone, but this is the photo of the screen. Okay. I. What are we looking at here? Same cell phone removed from its case and the case laying next to it. Okay. What's this? That's the black satchel that I referenced earlier. In terms of states, okay. Is this now that same satchel just removed from the vehicle itself? It is. This is L. What are we looking at here? I opened one of the zippered pockets to try to photograph what was inside of it before it was removed. And then can you tell what this is right here, kind of this gold bar going across at this point? It's a zipper for uh, a top view of a, a small zippered pouch that was inside the satchel. This is M. What are we looking at here? And that's that small zippered pouch. N, as in Nancy. Evan zipped the pouch and uh, photographed the interior. And that's that smaller little brown pouch that was inside the satchel. Correct. What are we looking at here? This is the contents of that small zippered was there anything else inside that small zippered pouch other than these various IDs and cards? No. Okay. What are we looking at in this photo here? And this is the, the large main compartment of that black satchel. I unzipped it and photographed the interior. This is Q. What is this a photograph of? That's a photograph of all of the contents of the main compartment of that black satchel and also a photograph of that small zippered pouch. This is R. Is this just another close-up photo of that image we just saw? Correct. By the way, what, what's in this bag right here, if you know? Well, not forensically tested, but it appeared to be tobacco leaves. Okay. This is S. What is this phone that we're looking at here? That's the, the face or the screen of a cell phone that was found inside the large main compartment of the black satchel. What are we looking at in this one? That same cell phone in its case, but the back of it. Okay. <clears throat> then the last one for this exhibit, what are we looking at here? The same cell phone, its back cover, and also next to the case that has been removed. You may. In terms of uh, moving him from the car to this location, it's possible that maybe hand positions change or something like that as you're moving him to this location, right? Yes, and that's evident in the, the photograph of later of the left hand because that photograph shows that it, it was now, currently when I photographed it, in the former position of the right hand before he was removed. Okay. So if we take a look at B... Is this a photograph just trying to show the hand being opened up to see if there's anything of note, or of note in this image? Correct. Okay. Who's, who's 
bending the fingers down? Do you know? Is it you or the medical examiner? The medical examiner. Got it. And then C, like we discussed, this was the bag to preserve the evidence on that hand, right? If there was any present, yes. Now if we take a look at D, is this now his left hand? It is. Okay. And again, in terms of moving his hand or his position, it could have happened between the car and bringing him down to the ground. Yes. Looking at E. Again, is this the medical examiner opening up his hand to see if there's anything of note, I guess, in the palm of his hand? Yes. Okay. And then lastly, F. Again, a bag was placed on to preserve any potential evidence, right? Yes. Okay, so I know we jumped ahead in time to when you searched the back of the car when it's back at the crime scene, but now let's go back. We're at 4015 Broadway. Where's your next assignment? Where do you go? I respond to CSI Ali's location, which is near the suspect's residence, as she was working a scene there to see if I could assist her before I went to the Tika address. Okay. And do you recall what time you were done at the first location, 4015 Broadway? I believe it was, I arrived at the Teak location at 547, so spent about a half hour. 517 is when I arrived at the second location. Okay. And when you get there, are there already uh, PBSO officers there? Yes. Okay. Is crime scene tape set up around the area? Yes. And you said that CSI Ali was already there starting to do some crime scene investigation work? Right. She was at the secondary scene uh, where casings had been located and uh, blood-like stains. And I assisted with swabbing some stains for her. Okay. And when you arrive on that scene, are photographs also taken of the exterior of 550 Teak as well as the road where the casings were found? Well, that would be my third scene. My secondary scene was Redwood with CSI Ali. I didn't take any photographs there because that was her saying that she already photographed the area. I just swabbed areas of blood-like stains for her. Then I went to the Teak address, and yes, exterior photographs were taken. Okay. And although uh, CSI Ali took photographs down on uh, the Redwood Drive where the casings were found, are you familiar with what that scene looked like when you arrived? I am the roadway and where the stains were that I swabbed. Uh, but she had pretty much wrap, was wrapping up collecting her casings and her stanchions. Okay. And did you see the stanchions all placed in the road? Or the blood-like stains. She was done collecting uh, her firearms evidence. Got it. So in terms of when you get to that location, do you, you go to where the blood-like stains are first? Yes. I meet with her, and she points them out to me. And at that point... You stated that uh, there were stanchions, I guess you called them? Yes. Uh, do you recall how many stanchions were on the ground in terms of the casings by the time you got there? The casings, I believe, had already been picked up, but stanchions remained for the blood-like stains that I was going to be swabbing, and there were six. So once you swab those blood-like stain areas, and we'll get back to that, do you then go and start taking even more photographs once at that scene? At the Teak scene. The 550 Teak Drive? Right. After I clear helping uh, or assisting CSI Ali, Ali, I clear Redwood, and then I go over to Teak. And that's when my part of the investigation starts with photographs. Okay. Permission to approach, Judge? May be states 54A through double E. If you can just take a look at these photographs real quick, just make sure you recognize them and then we'll start talking about them.
Okay, I remember I recognized some of them because I took them. Okay. Uh, beginning with F and continuing to the end of the photographs um, are CSI LEs. Okay. So starting with number F, I guess? Yes. Okay. Judge, state seeks to admit, I believe there's no objection at this point. We'll admit all of them and have her talk about what, the one she knows. Yes, I understand that to be the case. Admitted without objection. All right. So we'll start out with A. What are we looking at here? This is the front of 550 Teak. Okay. And in the foreground, or I guess in the middle of the picture here, can you just tell the jury what these lines are that are going across the home? That's barrier tape. Okay. What about B? It's the same, but it's more uh, to the southwest. Okay. What is this road? kind of going along the right side of the photograph, if you know. That's Redwood. Okay. This is state C. Over a little bit. What are we looking at here? This is the exterior uh, west side of 550 Teak. Okay. So what road is this side of the house facing? Redwood. States D. What are we looking at here? Uh, just some cameras that were attached to the west face of that residence. States E. What are we looking at here? This is still the west side, but further south. So, and this would be encompassing the back or south yard. Of which address or which residence? 550 Teak. Now, I know this one looks a little dark, and this is F. Can you tell what we're looking at here? Uh, that This would begin CSI Ali's photographs of her scene. I can only guess it's Redwood. I don't know. I wasn't there when the photographs were taken. Got it. States S as in Sam. Okay. What are we looking at here? Again, CSI Ali's photograph and her scene. I wasn't there. I didn't view that when I was there on the scene. I was there to swab the blood like stains. Do you recall so yellow what markers? I know because we all use the same. They are stanchions that mark evidence. Got it. Do you remember which stanchions were, were the location of the blood like stains that you tested or swabbed? I do. Okay. Could you tell the jury how many of them there were? I swabbed six stains uh, on Redwood Drive, all of them on Redwood Drive, at various um, addresses. The first one at 586, the next at 580, <clears throat> three more at 580 but on the sidewalk, and the last at 574. And those were marked by stanchions 40 through 45. Got it. So in terms of this photograph here, and I know it might be difficult to see, is this number 40, stanchion number 40? I can't see it from Let me bring it up. And again, this is states S. Yes, 40 and 41 and 41. So right here is number 40, the first blood like stain that you indicated, right? That I swabbed, yes. And then this one in the back, is that number 41? Yes. Okay. Show you an alternative photo. Now, is this just getting closer now to stanchion 41, 42, and 43? Yes. What are we looking at in this one? That's a close-up of stanchion 40 and the blood like stain. Okay. Is that the blood like stain you're referring to? It is. Now, why do you take a photograph, I guess, like this? 
that's part of our protocol. We do overall mid range and then close up so that we know that 40, there's no other background noise and you can concentrate on your marker and the evidence itself. V is in Victor. What are we looking at here? This is a stanchion 41. Okay. And has blood-like stains around stanchion 41, right? Yes, that's the area I swapped. Moving on to W. What are we looking at here? With stanchions 42. 43 and 44, also marking blood-like stains that I swapped. And do you recall what address this is closest to, I guess, these, these uh, 40, right here? 42, 43, and 44 were all at 580 uh, Redwood, uh, but on the sidewalk. Okay. Showing now X. Again, is this just a close-up of stanchion 42? Yes. And where are the blood-like stains, if you can tell from this photograph? To the left. So right around here? Yes. Okay. Again, for Y, is this another close-up now moving to stanchion 43? Yes. Okay. Do you recall where the blood-like stain might have been here? To the left. To the left? Right here? It's hard to see, yeah, because the driveway was spotted with dark and dried vegetation and it rained. Okay. But in terms of uh, the blood-like stain, it's in this area right here? Yes. Okay. Now looking at Z, what are we looking at here? Stanch 44. Okay. Or where, a blood-like stain. Where was uh, 44 located, closest address? Oh, again, 580 Redwood on the sidewalk. Triple A. Again, is this just a close-up of 44 and a blood-like stain next to it? Yes. This one I might bring up to you, but can you tell if this is stanchion 45? It appears to be, yes. Bring it up to you, just to confirm. States BB. Yes, 45. Okay. And what was located at stanchion 45? And that was a blood-like stain I swabbed as well. And this would be at 574 Redwood. Got it. Is that uh, further south, further north than all the other stanchions that we no. saw? Further south. Okay. This is CC. Is this now close-up of stanchion 45 and the blood-like stain right below it? Yes. DD, what are we looking at here? It's down at the bottom, you can barely, yeah, but 45. 45? Yeah. Do you recall what this pathway is right here? It's a sidewalk, I believe. Yeah, west of this, it says on the, from the driveway, west of the sidewalk. Got it. And then the last one in this set, double E. Is this now just a pulled back shot of where stanchion 45 was located? Yes. Okay. And then judge, just permission to retrieve, I believe it states one, 1A. One All right, May, do you need the um, easel? Um, I can just hold it, Joe. Okay. Can you see this okay? See this, Brian? Yes. Okay. Now, in terms, uh, permission for her to step down, Judge? Sure. Please. Watch your step getting down. Might want to use the pointer as well, so neither of you blocks the view of the jury. So this is States 1A. Are, do you recognize this area? I do. Okay. What, what is this area? Um, so I tell you what, move over there so one of you can use the standing microphone and CSI Brandt can use.
Okay. So can you show us on this diagram where 550 Teak Drive is? Okay. Now, in terms of we're starting with stanchions 40 through 45, can you show the jury where those stanchions were located? Between Sable Palm, on Redwood, so between Sable Palm and the curve. Okay. And in terms of that last photograph we saw with that sidewalk kind of going along, do you, can you point out where that is on this, this map? I cannot. Okay. But it, in, it, the stanchions 40 through 45 are basically near this intersection of Sable Palm Drive and North Redwood Drive? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so after you're able to go down and work on those stanchions while Ali works on the shell casings, did there come a point in time where now you go to 550 Teak Drive and start taking pictures of the exterior of the residence? Yes. Okay. Permission to approach it? You may. This is states 36A through M. Take a look at those. Just let me know if you recognize them. I recognize these as photographs that I took. Great. And where did you take these then? What are what are these going to depict? 550 Teak, the exterior. We already saw some of these. What are we looking at here in A? This is the exterior west side of the residence. It shows a, a closer up of the starting of the backyard and the attached back porch and cameras. Okay. We look at. B. What's in this image? This is the driveway area, and it uh, reflects what the occupied driveway, and there's some uh, cameras attached to the north face of the residence by the garage. I think C. Is that what you're just talking about? Yes. What about image D? This is the approximate midsection of the front of 550 Teak. Letter E, what are we looking at here? These are ground lights along the walking path to the front door, some of which have been knocked over. Dates F, what are we looking at here? That's the corner of the residence, and it reflects a camera mounted outside. States G. This is, I'm sorry, this is uh, an exterior mounted camera above the front door. States H. What are we looking at? This is the exterior north, north face of the residence, uh, further east section of the residence. States I, what are we looking at here? Again, it's the approximate midsection of the north face of the residence. You can see the barrier tape, the ground cover lights, and a t-shirt laying on the ground. Now, I might as well, well, I'll finish these and we'll get to it. But in terms of that t-shirt that was found outside, did you collect that t-shirt as evidence as well? I did. Okay. States J, what are we looking at here? That's one of two vehicles that were parked in the eastbound lane uh, of Teak in front of the residence. Okay. States K, is this just a close-up of that same vehicle? No, uh, this is the second vehicle. Okay. The first one was an Infinity. This is a BMW. Then moving on to L. This, what do we see in this one? 
this is the front of that BMW. Okay. And then can you tell the jury what that is right there? It's an impact mark with uh, a large radiating fractures around the initial strike mark. Okay. It's in the front windshield, driver's side. Is there a difference between an impact mark and a, and a bullet, I guess, compared to the Cadillac that we saw? It, a, a bullet can cause an impact mark or a strike mark or a non-penetrating mark, and it can also be perforating, meaning it goes through and creates a hole. This is an impact mark. It did not go through. Got it. Do you know what caused that? Can you say what caused that damage to that vehicle? I don't know. It was present when I arrived, and that's why it was documented. Then the last one for this exhibit, M as in Mary, what are we looking at here? That's the same BMW. It's just the passenger side of it. Okay. And then in terms of any other defects to that BMW, did you notice any other defects on that vehicle short of the windshield? No. Then permission to approach with States 29, Judge? You may. If you could take a look at States 29, do you recognize what that is? Yes. What is it? It's an evidence bag I prepared and contains the black t shirt from the front yard of 550 Teak. State asked to admit 29 into evidence, Judge? Admitted without objection. Okay, so once you take photos of the exterior, did there come a point in time where a search warrant was authorized for you to go inside of 550 Teak to also take photographs? Yes. Okay. And did you do so? Yes. Okay. This is State's 35, Judge, as a composite exhibit. You can just look through those. We're going to be going through them anyway. If there's any that you eventually don't recognize, you can let us know. But if you can look through those, see if they're familiar. It's 35A through what? Triple W, Judge. Okay. Okay, I recognize all of these as photographs I took at 550 Teak. Great. 
State seeks, seeks to admit 35A through triple W, Judge. And they're admitted without, or it is admitted without objection. Permission to publish, Judge? May. Thank you. All right, we'll start with A. What are we looking at here? This is the exterior of the front door to 550 Teak. Okay. B. This is the front entry into 550 Teak. C. This is the living room area. Okay. Can you tell us if you know what this is up in kind of near the top left corner? It's a monitor that had uh, five different v camera views of the exterior of the residence. Okay. What are we looking here? This is what we've identified as the northwest bedroom, the brother's bedroom of the suspect. Uh, which brother, if you know? Or what was the name of the individual in that? I don't know. This is photograph E. Is this that same bedroom? It is. Now, in terms of documenting the inside of the house, did you try to go into every room and just take photographs of anything that might be there in terms of evidentiary value to document it? Yes, we do overall photographs of every room initially, and then go back and as we're searching through the rooms, um, focus again more photographs on evidentiary items. Photograph F. What is this? That's the same northwest bedroom. Now we'll move on to G. What are we looking at here? That's a bed and a mirror dresser in the northwest bedroom. H, what are we looking at here? This is in the northwest bedroom, and it's a view from the entry door into that bedroom into the living room. Okay. So in terms of out this door, this is kind of the center living room area of the home? Yes. What are we looking at here? This is again uh, in the bed, the same bedroom, northwest bedroom. Now we're looking inside of the bedroom, I guess, from the living room area. Yes. Okay. Jay, what are we looking at here? I'm sorry. Can you go back one photograph? Yes. That television is on. This is. Uh, what was identified to me, we were calling it in my report the North East bedroom, but identified to me as belonging to Travis Rudolph. A TV is on, <clears throat> that's his bedroom. So when That's we the North East bedroom. North East bedroom. So if we move to J, are we still talking about that same bedroom then? We are. This is the bed in the North East bedroom. Okay. That's another view of the bed. Do you know whose photograph that is up there? I don't know. Okay. L, what are we looking at here? That's another view of the northwest corner of that same bedroom. Okay. M is in Mary. What are we looking at here? That's a cell phone that was on the bed in the northeast bedroom. Okay. O. Same cell phone, same bed, same bedroom, just a closer view. Yeah. Excuse me, that was N, is a Nancy, this is O. What are we looking at here? This is out in the living room. So there's an opening in the living room wall that leads to two other bedrooms and a bathroom. And this is above that opening, so that would be the south east corner of the living room and that's the monitor I spoke of earlier that has camera views on it and behind which uh, is a DVR. P is in Peter. Is that the DVR, a closer up photo of the DVR you were just mentioning? Yes. In terms of Q, was this attached kind of or nearby that system? Yes. Uh, the security system. Yes. 
looking at R. Do you recall what this is? This was in the northeast bedroom, uh, just documents of showing cameras and possibly for the same cameras attached to the home that were discovered in a nightstand drawer. Yeah. S is in Sam. What are we looking at here? Okay, this is the floor of the northeast bedroom on the south side of the bed. Uh, so between the south side of the bed and the opening to the closet that was in the south wall. And then what is this right almost in the center of the photograph? That's part of a cover for a cell phone. Was there a cell phone inside of it before you took this picture? No. Okay. T, is this now just a close-up of that same cover? Yes. This is States U. What are we looking at here? This is on top of the upper shelf. This is attached to the wall in the closet in the northeast bedroom. And this is the west corner of that shelf. And this was Mr. Rudolph's bedroom's closet, right? Yes. What is this? A gun. What type of gun? A six hour. Okay. Do you know what caliber or what make and model? 223. This is V as in Victor. What are we looking at here? It's another photograph of that same area. What's right below the firearm? I can't see. There's a small safe on the shelf, um, a box above it, and on top of that is the firearm. W? What is this? That's a closer view of the gun. So you hadn't touched this gun at all prior to taking these photographs? No. X? What are we looking at here? This is a wallet. There was a top a dresser opposite the foot of the bed in the northeast bedroom. What are we looking at here? This is part of the contents of that wallet. Okay. That was states Y. Going to state Z. What are we looking at here? Same. More of the contents. We have a CCW and a driver's license in the name of Travis Rudolph. This is double A. What are we looking at here? That's atop the same dresser, but in a different area, and it's part of a front cover for a cell phone case. Okay. BB, what are we looking at here? That's a holstered handgun. Where did uh, where is this? I guess are we still in that same bedroom we've been talking about, the northeast bedroom? We are. Okay. So where, what drawer is this inside the of that bedroom? Top dresser drawer at the far end of the same dresser that um, held the the wallet and that red part of the red cell phone case. Okay. Now, when you came in to this bedroom, was this drawer already open, or did you have to open the drawer? We had to open it. CC, what are we looking at here? That's just a closer up view of that holstered gun in the drawer. Okay. Now, in terms of the gun we saw in the top of the closet and this gun right here, did you take those guns into custody? I did. DD, what are we looking at here? That's the six hour in a gun box after it was removed from the closet. EE, -E, what are we looking at here? Now I'm just taking uh, photographs of each section 
of this gun. FF. Is this just a close up of the trigger of that same gun? Right. And the grip. GG. This is the midsection of that same gun. Then HH. And this is the mu muzzle end of that same gun. And in terms of II, is this just another backed up version? It's just the flip side of the gun. Flip the gun around to take another close, uh, further out view of that. Yes. Okay. JJ, what are we looking at there? This is the midsection on the flip side of that same gun, and it does show uh, some markings, six hour SIG M400, which is, would be the model. KK, what is this? Now I'm beginning to photograph that holster gun that was in the gesture drawer. Okay. And where did you put it, I guess, to take this photograph? It's on the bed. LL, is that the same gun? Yeah, just uh, turned over. And when you located it, was it inside of this holster, inside of that dresser drawer? It was. M.M., okay. -M, is it Mary? What are we uh, looking photos at? of the gun with it now removed from the holster. Okay. N.N., <coughs> what are we looking at here? This is a close-up uh, of the midsection of the gun. It may show some markings. It's a little dark. I can't see. May approach the witness, Judge? May. And this is NN, is it Nancy? If you could take a look at that photo, can you tell what make and model of firearm that is? Yes, and also the um, originator, where it was made. Okay, and can you tell the jury what, what type of firearm that is? If it's an FN Herstal, which is F as in Foxtra, and is a Nancy Herstal, H-E-R-S-T-A-L, and it's made in Belgium. Thank you. Oh, oh. And we're this. just moving down, down the gun, uh, the slide area, and taking additional photographs. And PP, what are we looking at in that? This one? is the mu muzzle end of the FN Herstal, and that silver plate reflects the serial number. Okay. QQ, what are we looking at there? That's a loaded magazine. Where did that loaded magazine come from? From the Herstal. Okay. It was inside of it at the time? Yes. Okay. RR, what are we looking at here? That's another uh, loaded magazine. Okay. Was this magazine at full capacity or fully loaded? Yes. Okay. SS, what are we looking at here? This is a top view of one of a few of loaded magazines that I collected okay. showing the ammunition inside. Do you know what type of ammunition that is? Uh, 223, I believe. TT. This is literature that we found in the northeast bedroom uh, in the nightstand. And is it in relation to the first firearm that we saw in the closet in the top? It is. That attachment, that literature for that attachment was on the six hour from the closet. You, you. And this is the box for the prior literature, and that box contained another attachment, the same that was on the gun in the closet. So this right in the center is a different item than the gun itself that had a similar kind of attachment to it, right? Correct. VV, what are we looking at here? This is the literature that was discovered in the Northeast bedroom for the Sig Sauer that was in the closet. WW, what are we looking at here? This is the north end of area of the dresser not in the dresser, but next to the north end of the dresser from which the Effen Herstal gun was removed. These are hard sided um, handgun cases. And when you say these are, are you referring number one to this black container with the blue handles? Yes, and the one below. And then this one right here. Yes. Okay. 
XX, what are we looking at here? These are markings or labels that were on uh, one of those handgun carrying cases. Why, why? This is the interior of one of those gun boxes. Was anything removed or was it empty other than kind of this documentation that we're seeing here when you photographed it? It was as is when I photographed it. There's uh, the only um, firearms related evidence that was in there is in that manila envelope in the middle. And usually if you receive a firearm in the carry case, it always has a test fire in it from the manufacturer. Let's look at ZZ. What is that? That's the test fire round. So you said that was inside of like a manila envelope inside of that box? Yes. Triple okay. A, what are we looking at here? That's the manila envelope that I was referring to, and it has the test fire information, what caliber, who did it, when it, when it happened from the manufacturer. All right. Triple B, what are we looking at here? This is the exterior of one of those um, handgun carry cases. Triple C, what are we looking at here? This is the interior of uh, that same carry case. Triple D, what do we have here? These are two loaded handgun magazines that were in that carry case. Okay. And in terms of being loaded, were they fully loaded magazines? Yes. Now let's look at triple E. I can bring this up for you if necessary. Do you recognize this photograph? I do. What is depicted in this photograph? And that's the floor uh, on the west side of the bed in the northwest bedroom and part of a drum magazine that was located underneath the bed. So in terms of this bedroom, is this what you confirm to be Travis Rudolph's bedroom or a different bedroom? No, a different bedroom that was identified as belonging to his brother. Got it. Triple F, what are we looking at here? The closer view of that drum magazine in the same location. Triple G, what are we looking at here? This is that drum magazine having been removed from under the bed. Triple H, what are we looking at here? It's the top view of the loading area for the cartridges in that drum magazine. Okay. Now, did you take this drum, mag or this drum magazine into evidence as well? Yes. Okay. Were, were you able to count how many bullets were in this drum magazine? Yes. Do you recall how many there were? Can I refer to my report? Of course, if it helps. Just let me know when you're ready. Uh, there were 61 remaining cartridges in the drum magazine. Triple I, is this just another angle of that drum magazine? Yes, it's just turned on its side, so this would actually be an underneath view. Triple J, what are we looking at here? These are the cartridges that were in the drum magazine. Now let's look at Triple K. What are we looking at here? We're looking at a, a mirror dresser in the northwest bedroom where the drum magazine was found. Okay. So staying in that bedroom for Triple L, what are we looking at here? There are two cell phones that were atop the mirror dresser. Okay. Triple M. Are those those two same cell phones? We the same cell at? phones, yes. Okay. Triple N. What are we looking at there? This is the front screen of one of those cell phones. Now, was it already powered on, or did you have to power this phone on to do this? It was on. Triple O, is that the back of the phone that we just looked at? Yes. Okay. Triple P, what are we looking at here? That same cell phone, but removed from its case. Why do you remove the 
the cases from the phones. Because sometimes you find goodies in the case. Did you find any goodies or anything in the backs of these phone cases that you were taking off? No. Triple Q. Got that same phone now just to get the back side of it. Yes. Okay. Triple R. What are we looking at here? Now we're going back to the uh, northeast bedroom, the bedroom of Travis Rudolph, and we're taking a photograph of the label that was on one of the hard sided carry cases. Triple S. Is that the There's case? Another view of the case, a side view. Got it. And where was this located specifically in that bedroom? Do you recall? The northeast bedroom along the north end of the dresser that was against the west wall. Triple T. What are we looking at right here? That was found to be a uh, an ammo case case if you want to call it it's a, a big hard sided bin that had uh, hundreds of loose cartridges in it okay. fired cartridges or unfired cartridges no intact bullets okay. triple u what are we looking at here that was the label that was on that canister and where was that canister found again that was on the floor up against the uh, north wall in the northeast bedroom or Travis Rudolph's bedroom. Triple V, what are we looking at here? That's the contents of that ammo can. Then lastly for Triple W, what are we looking at right here? Part of the um, head stamps of some of the cartridges that were in that ammo can I believe there were three different kinds of cartridges and 227 total cartridges. Inside of that one, I guess. Inside that ammo can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Now, in terms, we know what caliber the uh, six hour was. Do you know what caliber or what type of gun was the handgun that you had found in the residence as well? The Herstal was a 5.7 by 28 semi auto pistol. So once you document by photographing, do you then go back to those different areas where you noticed uh, things of relevance and start taking those into evidence as well? Yes. Permission to approach, Judge? May. First, I'll start off with State's Exhibit 45. You can take a look at that one. What are we looking at for State's 45? This is an evidence bag. I prepared the contents of which are pistol magazines that were recovered from the northeast bedroom. Okay. You want to take a look at number 46? Tell us if you recognize that. I do. What is that? Uh, it's also an uh, evidence bag that I prepared for the uh, holster that the FN Herstal pistol from the dresser door was contained in. So you separated it out in terms of preserving it for evidence from the actual firearm itself? Yes, any firearms evidence, they just want the firearms. They don't want all the doodads that come with it. Got it. And then if you want to take a look at number 47, do you recognize that one? I do. What is that? The evidence bag that I uh, prepared uh, that contains the owner's manual for the 6-hour M400. Okay. This time Judge State seeks to admit 45, 46, and 47. Uh, admitted without objection, all three. Mm -hmm. 
now approaching with number 44, Judge. Take a look at that one. Do you recognize what's inside of that? It's uh, evidence back are prepared for the Flambeau ammo can. And so is that the one that had, I think you said, over 200 ammunition inside of it? That was yes, found in the closet? 200, 227 cartridges. Okay. Thank you. State seats to enter 44, Judge. Admitted without objection. May approach with 56, Judge? You may. Take a look at number 56. Do you recognize what that is? I do. What is that? Uh, the con it's an evidence bag I prepared, the contents of which is the Apple iPhone uh, that was atop the bed in the northeast bedroom. Got it. And that would be Travis Rudolph's bedroom? Yes. State seeks to admit 56, Judge? Admitted without objection. May approach, Judge? You may. First, I'm going to show you States 48. What are we looking at for that evidence bag? It's an evidence bag I prepared for the drum magazine and the cartridges contained in it. Okay. And so when you put it into this bag, did you leave all the bullets inside of that drum magazine, or did you take them all out and... Put the drum empty inside and all the bullets inside. No, it was uh, transported from the scene to our office intact. And then as we further document and process items of evidence, the cartridges were removed. Got it. And then the last one I have in terms of evidence, if you want to take a look at number 25. This is uh, evidence back or prepared for the Blue Apple iPhone in the clear case, and that which was... Um, from the black satchel in the trunk of the caddy. Right. And that was recovered once the car had been moved back to the crime scene kind of headquarters and you went further in terms of evaluating that Cadillac. Yes. yes. Judge State seeks to admit 48 and 25. They're both admitted without objection. Now, in terms of the Cadillac. Um, do you end up drawing any types of diagrams to show kind of where all the de different defects of the vehicle, uh, where you located them? No. Okay. Does anybody draw a diagram sometimes in your field? Sometimes if it's not as many as there were, there was just too much information to put in one, one sheet of paper. Got it. So in terms of once you get the Cadillac back to kind of crime scene, uh, headquarters, we'll call it, were you able to notate the total number of defects on the outside of that black Cadillac? Yes. How many were there? 30. Okay. And then in terms of defects on the inside of the vehicle, uh, how many were you able to count? 53. Okay. Now, is it possible that on the inside of the vehicle that multiple defects could have been caused by a singular bullet? Yes. So is that why we might have a difference between the number of shots on the outside of the car versus what's messed up on the inside of the yes. car? Yes. If you have one bullet traveling through multiple surfaces of one particular area, it's going to be the same, basically the same defect. Okay. Just one moment, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Now, after you take all that evidence into your custody at the home, 
around, is there a time that comes up on April 13th that you also go and collect autopsy evidence from the medical examiners? Oh, it's, it's brought to me and secured in our drying room. Usually one of the day shift CSIs has to do the picking up of that evidence because my hours aren't conducive to that. So that's what was done. A CSI from day shift picked it up, secured it in the drying room, and then when I came in, I took custody of it. May I approach with 42 and 43, Judge? May. Take a look at number 42. Do you recognize that? I do. What is that? This is an evidence bag containing autopsy evidence, uh, sealed vanilla envelope con containing projectile debris fragments from the right back of the victim. Okay. And these came from Dr. Marlon Osborne in the medical examiner's office, right? Yes. You can look at number 43. What is that one? This is an evidence bag I prepared for additional uh, autopsy evidence received, and it's nine individual manila envelopes, all labeled with the victim's name and the location from which nine projectiles were removed from his body at autopsy. Okay. Thank you very much. State seeks to enter 42 and 43, Judge. They're admitted without objection. Now, we talked about a lot, uh, CSI Brandt, in terms of all the photos you took, the evidence that you collected. Going back to 415 Broadway, were you ever asked to search the rooftops of that area in that location? No. Did you, I think we saw in the photos there's a food truck kind of behind a chain link fence. Did you ever go behind that chain link fence to look for any firearms or anything like that? I did not. Were you ever requested to do so at that time? No. Okay. And then in terms of either alleyways nearby or sewer gutters, did you go digging in a sewer gutter to see if there were any firearms there? No, we, I searched and we photographed what was available to us around the caddy, near the caddy, so that front lot of that property. And aside from, you know, the bullet defects in the vehicle and obviously a deceased person, did you have any indication from when you're looking in the car or around the car that there were firearms at that location? No. So given everything we've spoken about, about going to 415 Broadway, going to 550 Teak Drive, all your photographs, all your evidence collection, does that pretty much summarize everything that you're involved in in terms of this case and evidence collection? Yes, other than all of the follow-up that was required to photograph, re-photograph and document evidence that was collected and the packaging and disseminating for, to evidence, uh, those three scenes and the photographs entails all of my involvement in this case. All right. I don't have any further questions, Judge. I just want to retrieve that evidence to put it back in order. All right. Very well. Do that. And uh, while um, Mr. Klausi is doing that, we'll take a 90-second stand-up and stretch break, folks.
Folks, we're going to actually have to take a little longer break. Um, uh, but what I would like to do, just uh, for your edification and, uh, and for organization purposes, I'd like to finish with this witness, which means cross-examination and potential uh, redirect before we take a lunch break, if that's all right with you all. Okay? All right. Um, so we'll take a 15-minute break, roughly 15 minutes. So let's be back here at 11.45, please. 11.45, remembering and obeying the four cardinal rules while you're back there. No research, no discussion, and open mind, and you will not run into any of us. <clears throat> I take your notepads, put them face down your chair, please. Numbers up. Give me a refill of water, that'd be great. You would like more water? You take a bottle of water? Oh, that'd be, yeah. Bottle of water? Please. Okay. Thank you.
If it's on the proper receipt that's on the bag, yes.
You have more for those? So you must have more. Oh, I got it. Right here, right here. Perfect. Thank you. That's all there is? Yes. Yeah, hold on.
Come to order. Court is back in session. Okay, we all set? Ready to bring him back? Yes? Okay. Last exhibit entered and then issued. Okay, all right. Say again? I won't be finished before lunch. Yeah, you will. We're just going to wait and take a lunch break when you're done. Well, that's not fair, Judge. You're imposing a reasonable conditions on the defense. It's 10 to 12, and this is a... a Who says we have to take a lunch break at 12? No, no problem. It's unfair, Judge. Okay. Duly noted. We're on the ninth day of this trial, folks. And as I've said umpteen times, I've got another murder trial that's supposed to start on Friday. Uh, while we're waiting for the jury, I think somebody, a member of the press wanted to take photos. I'll, I'll get to that later, all right? Thank you. Welcome back, folks. Go ahead and take your seats. All right, Mr. Shiner, you may begin your cross. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. May I approach the witness, Judge? Yes, you may. This is State 70. Take a look at that. You recognize it? I do. Okay, what is that? The evidence bag I prepared for a gray Apple iPhone and a black otter box that was atop the dresser in the northwest bedroom. Okay. And uh, whose bedroom was that again, just for clarification? Uh, Travis Rudolph's brother. Got it. State seek to admit number 70, Judge? All right. And as I understand it, that's admitted without objection. All right. Finish with direct. Just look here for a second, Judge. looking at oh. I'm sorry I guess you're not finished with direct I thought you had been I think I just have to do this judge just okay sure this is X. Is that the cell phone we were just talking about or a different one that's inside of that bag no this is in this photograph is in uh, Travis Rudolph's bedroom which is the Northeast the phone we just published was in the Northwest Triple A. What phone is that? It's not a phone. It's part of a case. That's just the empty case. Anyway. Right. Right. So in terms of the brother's bedroom, is that that's where that cell phone that we just admitted was located? Correct. Where was it found in the room? On top of the mirror dresser. And in terms of the other cell phone that you collected, in terms of going through the house, where was that one found when you first went into the house? Uh, on the bed in Travis Rudolph's bedroom. Thank you very much, Your Honor. You're no welcome. further questions. All right. Cross exam. Yes, sir. Morning, ma'am. Morning. Do you agree as a crime scene investigator you only get one chance to basically do it right, right? You only get one chance at a scene, yes. Right. Do it right. We only get one chance to photograph, document, collect. One chance to 
to leave the scene, uh, can be contaminated, somebody could steal something, somebody could add something. So that's why you make sure you get everything while you're at the scene uh, as much as humanly possible, right? Correct. And obviously you've got a lot of experience, you've been doing this a long time, right? Yes. And um, you've probably been to hundreds of cases, or thousands probably in your career, right? Yes. All right. You're, you're, you're getting paid to be here, right? I'm sorry, what? You're getting paid to be here, right? Yes. All right, and uh, if you work overtime, you get paid, right? Yes. And if you come to a deposition, you also get paid by the sheriff? Yes. Uh, you weren't limited in, in your time to be uh, working on this case at all, were you? Nobody said you only have five hours, 50 hours, 1,000 hours. You had as many hours as you needed, right? Correct. And nobody pressured you to rush at any of the uh, crime scenes you worked on in this case? No. And you feel you had enough time at, to do your job, right? Yes. Okay. So when you go to a, a crime scene like 40th and Broadway, the first one you went to that night, do you generally know what you're doing without taking directions, or do you basically talk to the lead detective and try to figure out what y'all are going to do together? How do you do that? It's collaborative. I receive a briefing. Uh, from the detective or, or deputy who's on scene, and they let me know information on the particular scene or information known thus far. And then I take it from there, do a walk around, and then I start documenting. All right, and is that briefing uh, over, or can they give you information as it comes along during the, during the day? Or it's not uncommon for them to add information as they gain more information and share it with me. Because then you might think other things that may not have been relevant could later on become relevant if you find additional information, right? It's possible, yes. Uh, so th the first place you go in this case was 40th and Broadway? Yes. And you arrived there sometime in the middle of the night? Yes. And do you have any information that any of the West Palm Beach, uh, well, first of all, how many West Palm Beach police officers do you think were there when you were there? I don't know. I didn't count. Too many to count probably, right? I'm sorry? Too many to count, like there was multiples? There were multiples, but not too many to count. I just, that's not something I do, is count how many heads are there. All right. Uh, did you ask anybody from West Palm to give you a hand? To give? You a hand. No. Yeah. How come? You had enough uh, help? Not their scene. So okay. any resources that I may have needed in addition to what was there would have come from the sheriff's office at my request. All right. There's, well, how many employees do you all have? <clears throat> a couple of thousand? I'm sure. All right. And sworn deputies, <laughs> at least a thousand or more? I guess. Did you ask anyone to help you while you were at the scene? I had assistance from crime scene manager Bronson. Okay. And she's, she's really experienced as well, right? Yes. All right. If you needed any help from anybody else from the sheriff's office, could you have called for help? Yes. Okay. And do you guys have a mutual aid agreement between other county police agencies, such as West Palm Beach? In other words, do you all help each other if, if it's needed? Sure. Okay. So if you really needed West Palm, they could have helped you too, right? They wouldn't be my first go-to, but they would have, I'm, I'm sure if I'd asked, they would have made him, themselves available. Okay. And you were not limited in the amount of time you spent on 40th and Broadway, right? Correct. <clears throat> In 40th and Broadway, you said you we saw we saw the photographs. You probably took hundreds of photographs at 40th and Broadway, right? Yes. All right, let me let me ask you about a couple of them. I'll show you what's been uh, entered into evidence from the state. State Exhibit Number Twelve. I'll read you the letter that I'm putting up on the, on the screen. They're actually not labeled. It's Twelve A through G. None of them have designations. I can't tell you which one I'm putting up. I'm sorry. It's from Exhibit Twelve.
All right, that's obviously the Cadillac in question, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and behind. All right, and so this gas station obviously is closed this time of night, right? Yes. You don't know if there was a working gas station or automotive shop or if it was permanently closed. You don't know. Well, it's labeled as an automotive repair shop, and there were no gas pumps. The property itself just looked like it used to be a gas station. Okay. Do you know if it was open during the, obviously not in the middle of the night, but during the daytime or it was abandoned or you don't know? I don't know. Did you ever go back in the daytime? I did not. So this area here, the fenced area, I don't know, was it your term that this was a, a mobile home? It looked to me like an RV. All right. Is it possible it's also a food truck maybe? Anything's possible. Well, did you take pictures? I don't know. Did you go inside the fenced area? I did not. Were you told by any of the police officers, the first responding officer or any of your supervisors that night, that the officer who found the two guys out of the car who were, who were alive were silhouettes in the background in this area here? No. If you were told that, would you have possibly looked back here to see if they discarded anything? Yes, or at least gotten access to it so it could be searched and photographed. All right. And access meaning there's probably a lock on the gate? Yes. You all can cut locks with no problem, right? I mean, the police yes. can do that. But you, you weren't given that information that there was possibly two guys, silhouettes here not waving the police down. Did you hear that, that the officer who got there found it suspicious because the two surviving or living men were not waving anyone down? They, did you no. hear that? At this point, that's true. Sustained. Well, did you hear anything at all that the two men who were alive from this car we're not waving a police officer down. No. From the police, I'm talking. Not from the individuals, I'm talking from the police. No. Okay. So as, as you sit there today, you can't tell us if there's any casings back here uh, behind the fence area or on the roof of this truck or van or whatever it is, if there's any, any cell phones back there, any guns back there from this particular case. You wouldn't know, right? Correct. Did you ever find out when you were at 550 Teak Drive later um, in the morning? I know you went there and you told us you, you helped CSI Alley. You picked up the six swabs and then you went to 550 Teak Drive and we'll, we'll go through those photographs again. But when you were there during that scene early in the morning, you remember finding out there was a gun found about 100 feet from the shooting scene? Yes. Okay. And when you found that out, you didn't know whose gun it was, did you? I didn't, know. Did the lead investigator ever say, do me a favor and go back here now that we found a gun that doesn't belong to Travis Rudolph? Go back here and check back here in this area? No. If you, if you were asked that by your supervisors, the detective, the, the lieutenants, whoever was there, would you have went back there and did that? Yes. So when you were there, you, you didn't have any indication there was anything that could have been discarded. No, nobody told you, right? No. So all you did was focus in the lot area like you testified to? Yes. Okay. Do you remember if there was a fence on the other side of this uh, garage? I believe there was, yes. Let me see if I can find that picture. I don't know if it's here. I don't see that photograph. Give me a second.
Well, that photograph's not in evidence, but you, you do recall a similar type fence as we saw in that last photo, right? Yes. And obviously, uh, well, not obviously, you would agree you didn't go back and search that fence area either, did you? Correct. Okay. And you didn't go back later on to do it when a gun was discovered later that morning, right? No. And to your knowledge, if anyone from the sheriff's office would have went back to 40th and Broadway to search the roofs, the fenced area, would have been you, right? Not necessarily. It may have, depending on when it occurred, okay. if someone had gone back there during day shift in the morning or in the afternoon, obviously I'm not working, so they would have asked another CSI if uh, evidence had been found to come and document and collect. So you all have a 24-hour around the clock. Someone's always on, on duty or in on call. Yes. All right. Do you have any knowledge if anyone from the sheriff's office went back? to look in the fenced area that we just talked about? I do not. I'll show you some exhibits from states number 53 that's been entered into evidence. Same question, the, the roof area above this. Uh, is this a working facility or is it not working or you don't know? I forgot what you said. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's vacant. It's it's labeled like it's a working business, but I don't know for a fact that it is. Okay. Uh, this roof area, uh, you never went up there, did you? No. And you could you could personally do it with ladders or you have drones, right? You can send a drone up there too, can't you? Yes. Uh, and there was no reason in, in your mind when you initially got there to even think about doing it, right? No, I didn't receive any information that that area should be considered. Are you 53E? Uh, so would this photograph be the south wall adjacent to the parking area for this gas station or the automotive shop? Yes. And do you know what kind of building this is? Like if it's an open building, closed, not open, but at the time, but is it a... What is this? I mean, what do you remember? I don't know. All right. Um, this building is obviously higher than the, the gas station, right? It's higher? Higher. The wall goes higher or similar to it? I don't know the elevation reference between the two. I, I don't understand. Right, I'm trying to just get from the, from the ground here. You can't see on the roof level of, of this uh, building, oh, can you? Oh, no. No. And same thing for the gas station. You can't see on the roof from ground level, right? Correct. Same questions. No, you didn't search the roof of uh, the, this building here. No. And to your knowledge, nobody did. For law I'm not enforcement. aware that anyone did. Sorry. I'm not aware that they did. Okay. So you 53 M inside the uh, let me get out of the way inside the black Cadillac <clears throat> the dash was still on right yes you know if anyone checked if there was a GPS um, put into this car? I didn't. I don't know if someone else did. Y'all right, have people who can do that at the sheriff's office? I don't know if our fleet would take care of that or we'd call somebody else out. I don't know. Right. And in terms of the uh, 
cell phones, you, you, don't, you don't know anything about it, or maybe you do. Do you know anything about any cell phones being checked if a, a GPS was plugged into somebody's phone on August, uh, on April 7th, rather, of 2021? That information I, I wouldn't know about. All right. You collect the phones and it's up to the detectives to decide if they're going to do something with them? Correct. And the, if something is going to be done, then um, media would take care of that for downloads and et cetera. You have a special department at the sheriff's office for that, right? Yes. All right. You, you heard there was two guys that were in this Cadillac along with the decedent prior to the car coming to its final resting spot, right? Yes. Did anyone give you a phone from either one of the men who were in the parking lot that came out of this Cadillac? Did any law enforcement give you one, a phone from either one of those people? No, I have one phone from the scene, but that was in the vehicle. Sure. So <clears throat> you have no knowledge if, do you know the names of the two men that were out? Do you, if, if I tell you the names, would it ring a bell possibly? One of them was Tyler Robinson. Okay. Yeah, he wasn't in the car. It was a guy named Keyshawn Jones. It was an injured party. Right, that was back up by Teak a couple blocks right. away. Right. I'm talking coming out of the car, the two guys that were initially in the car. Was a man named Keyshawn Jones and Chris Lowe. Do you, do, do you know either one of them? No. Any contact with them in this case? I believe they were on scene when I was on scene, and I saw them conversing with Detective Vanderlyn, okay. but I didn't have any direct contact with them. All right. Did Detective Vanderlyn give you a phone from either one of those men? No. All right. And you also found two phones in the trunk of the car? Yes. And the phone in the pocket was next to the decedent in the door pocket, right? Yes. All right. Do you know that's Tyler Robinson's phone, or you wouldn't know that? I don't know who the owner of that phone is. All right. Let me show you. That's number 15. Admitted into evidence. Is that the phone you found in the door pocket? Yes. Is there any, did you find any kind of blood like substance, human tissue, hair and fiber that may have been from someone who was shot? Anything like that on this phone? No, just uh, damage to the phone. And looked to you like it was ballistic damage based on where it was placed in the door? It's possible that it was based on the holes and the defects in the door. And what, was it was it consistent with the damage to the door pocket of the car getting struck while it was in the door pocket of the car? Yes. All right. And this was in, so I'm clear, this was in the passenger door right near the decedent. Yes. Okay. Did you know the city of West Palm Beach had cameras, cameras uh, that, that may have captured the path of the Cadillac driving from Teak Drive to where its final resting spot it's was? possible. I know there are neighborhood cameras, but I don't know for sure if West Palm has them in the area or in the path the vehicle may have traveled. Uh, did anybody that evening ask you to do a search of a possible path that the Cadillac traveled to see if there was any relevant evidence for a jury to possibly see at a later date? No. If they would have asked you to do that, would you have been able to accomplish that? Yes. And if you needed help, there was plenty of police officers who could help you with that? Yes. Anyone ask you to look for cameras from businesses or homes where this car may have passed by, the Cadillac? Not specifically, but when in the area at the gas station, I looked. Um, Just in that area? Oh, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll, give me a second. Sorry. You know from this case, from doing all the work you did, that the car came from Teak Drive and Lake Park, the 40th and Broadway to the 
that business that we just <clears throat> saw in the pictures, right? Yes. All right. Did you drive that area at any time to check for cameras or business cameras or house cameras to see if anything was captured on that related to this case? I did not. You said you had no indication. The reason why you initially didn't look for guns is you had no indication that inside the car there may have been a gun, right? Correct. Okay. Well, how would you have an indication if someone got rid of it? How would you know if you don't look around? How would you know that the people in the car had a gun before you got there if they dumped it somewhere if nobody checked? How would you know that? I'm not sure I understand your question. Right. How do I know what I don't know? Yeah, exactly. So well, when I'm documenting a crime scene, I have to go on what is known to the to the detectives or the deputies at that time in order to process my scene. Sure. If I gain more information as I'm processing my scene, I'll add that to my processing menu. Okay, so if you don't know something. So if I don't know, then I don't know how to act on it. Of course. I get it. I'm not faulting you. I'm just trying to get out that if no one told you that there may have been a gun or multiple guns in the decedent's car, how would you know that, right? Correct. You weren't there when this incident happened. No, I didn't receive any information about guns. Okay. And even when a gun may have been found 100 feet from where this incident occurred, that didn't trigger anyone to tell you to go back and do a further search? I wasn't asked to go back to the business on Broadway to do a further search. If you would have known that while you were there, if you got a call from someone and said, hey, Ms. Brandt, do me a favor. We just found a, a gun dumped by a fence um, 100 feet from where this happened where one of the alleged victims were running. Would that have triggered you to possibly do a further search while you were there on Broadway? I'm sure. Nobody showed you this or gave you details that there was a gun found right by the fence area through one backyard while you were at 40th and Broadway, right? No. Okay. Could you go back a second day? Not you personally, but you, you or somebody from the sheriff's office. Let's say they say, oh, wow, you know what? One of these guys... Or claiming their victims had a gun, maybe other guys are are not being truthful either. So can you go back once the tape's off? Is there any rule saying you can't go back and check again? No, you can go back. All right. So did anyone ask you or anyone in your department to go back and search the path of travel from the Cadillac the second day? I was not asked. Okay, I'm talking. To my knowledge, no one else in crime scene was asked to do that. Okay. So the 7th, the 8th, or 9th of April 2021, no one asked you or anyone in your apartment, to your knowledge, to go back to search the path of travel of the car, right? Correct. Or 40th and Broadway to search roofs, behind fenced areas, right? Correct. Did anyone ask you to photograph the injuries, the two gentlemen that were talking to Detective Andalyn, Chris Lowe, and Keyshawn Jones while you were there? No. You normally do that if someone's involved in a fight or a shooting? Yes, but also we get help from the detectives who are able to take photographs if I'm, I'm not immediately available or an investigator is not immediately available. So the police themselves have the ability to take photographs? Yes. Okay. So you don't know if that was done. You didn't do it, but you don't know if the detectives did it in this case. Correct. And let's talk about photographs of, of individuals. Um, no one asked you to ever take a photograph of Mr. Travis Rudolph, did they? No. Um, and you could have done that when he came out of his home and was in handcuffs. If someone asked you to, to document his injuries or lack of injuries, you could do that with photographs, right? 
If asked, I could have photographed him, yes. Right. To your knowledge, do you know if anybody from crime scene did that? I'm not aware that anybody had contact with him. How about uh, someone named DJ or Daryl Rudolph? Same questions. Were you asked to photograph him? No. Uh, you know, to your knowledge, nobody was asked to photograph him, right? I'm not aware of anyone else who was asked. Okay. Go back to uh, State's Exhibit Number Fifty Three N. Is it Nancy? This, this obviously looks like, looks like a pen. Yes. Uh, there's no relevance to this case, as far as you know. Not that I'm aware. Okay. Did you find any anything else on this side, on the floor, on the driver's floorboard? No. Fifty-three Q, as in Queen. Queen. You've seen hands similar to this in suicides, haven't you? With people holding guns. I've seen hands in that similar position on several scenes. Not talking suicide. Criminal and non-criminal. I'm talking suicide. Sometimes. Okay. I'm going to show you uh, it's been entered into evidence. States exhibit number four. Huh? I, I don't need clothes, I'm fine. I'm sorry? I'm fine without clothes unless you want me to put them on. Apparently, the state wants you to. I'm not really sure why, honestly, at this point, but. You want me to put them on, Judge? Yeah. I'll just need one, thank you. You have the ability to take that off? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Can you rack it back or I'll do it? All right, thank you. Put it back, thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Defense exhibit number four. It's been added into evidence. No clip in it, and the deputy cleared it. So no. oh, I'm sorry. You said defense. State's exhibit four. Apologize. Right. And the the last uh, exhibit you were talking, you said defense as well. Aren't those all state? Those are all state. Yeah. Everything that you used so far. Yes, sir. That's what I thought. Okay. That. That's okay. All right. Would you agree that? Holding the gun this way.
obviously, if, if I'm holding a gun like this, right, can you see this? I can. Okay. Now remove it. Does my hand look like the decedent's hand? You don't talk to the medical examiner to try to get information like that which is consistent with the seat in hand with holding a firearm, do you? No. You're just photographing and collecting evidence, right? Yes, processing. Would you agree you took about 50 pictures, 30 to 50 pictures of the seat in hand and the sitting position he was in, up close, all different positions? I don't know that it was... 50 <laughs> photographs, but he was photographed in situ, so that would mean as I see him in the in the vehicle, parts of him, and then once again, as he's removed from the vehicle and about to be processed into the body bag, more photos. Numerous, numerous photos indicating where his hand position was at his final resting place. Several photos of his hands and him. Okay, even up close photos? Yes. Okay. Skip around a little bit because pictures are in order somewhat. I'll show you the state's exhibit number 53B and entered into evidence. The right side up? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so obviously, this will be the front headlight of. Cadillac. Right front. Did you find a bullet back there? No. Do you believe there was one back there? It's possible, but not from my reach through the housing into the light assembly itself. Did you ever find out if this light was broken prior to this incident? I didn't have any information that that was true. All right. Do you know how this was broken? No, I don't. Does it look like a bullet struck it, or you don't have an opinion? The damage that is to the housing, to the headlight housing itself and not the interior, is larger than you would typically see in a single bullet hole. But that may be because of the material is fragile and it broke apart in larger pieces. So, But I do not know for a fact that a bullet hole caused that damage. you have an opinion? Based on your training and experience and what you observed? If you I have... I have an opinion that based on uh, the circumstances, it would not be out of the realm of possibility that bullet hole caused that damage. Okay. There was a couple of flat tires on, on this car, right? And I'll show you 53, states 53X. Do you agree that's the passenger front tire? Yes. And that it's flat? Yes. Did you find a bullet in there? No. Did you look? No. Did it look like a bullet struck it or you don't know? That I don't know. Okay. Was there another flat tire on this car? No. How about on the back of the driver's side? Remember one remember that tire being flat? I don't know if you can see it. No, I, I can't see it there. Look, my approach to witness, Judge. You may. 53 DD, you see a flat tire in this photograph? In the back. That's a door. All right. What's this? That's a reflection. Oh, it's a reflection? Yeah. Okay, let me get the, the door is open this way. Here's the, the door jam. So that's the reflection of the front tire. Yeah. Right, let me keep looking. Thanks.
Did you take a picture of the driver's side? Yes. You don't you don't have any photos with you, do you? No. I believe it was on the video. Do you remember the video of your walkthrough? Do you remember seeing a flat tire in the back or behind the driver's side, the rear tire? The left rear passenger behind uh, the driver's? When you say left, so if I'm, if I'm behind the I'm car? I'm saying left is driver's side. So if I'm behind the car, right. it would be to my left? You're facing the trunk? Facing the trunk. So on your left. Okay, so yes, we, that, that side, the rear tire, I thought it was on your video when you walked through that, that tire. I don't recall seeing that any of those tires, I mean, they're low profile, so it may have looked like it was flat, but I don't recall, I don't recall the, um, the right front, the passenger front being flat. We can always look at that again. As far as you remember, you don't think it was? No. Okay. All right. Was not. Let me show you. Uh, it's not labeled. One second. Pen, uh, states 12, 12 a, a through G. I don't know which letter this is, but you're right. That, that's not flat. No. Okay. The only flat tire was the one in the front. Yes. Did you, did you see? Or do you, did you get under the car to see how the engine leaked all that oil where the bullets went through? I did not. Do you know if it was through the front of the tire, of the car possibly? Through it the grill? Appeared, I'm sorry. It appeared it began under the engine compartment when I first got there. That's where it was concentrated. And as I remained at the scene, the fluid started drifting towards the back of the vehicle. Sure, but obviously from this case, bullet holes must have hit. What the, the, the pan with the oil or the engine, right? Oh, no doubt. Right. Did you get under there to see which direction the bullets came from to hit the engine or the oil pan? No. So, is there any way of knowing if it came from the front of the car, or the side of the car, back of the car? Can you tell? No. Okay. The night owl cameras we looked at. Let's go to those pictures. It's 54. I'll tell you what letters. <clears throat> Let's start with the outside of the house. 54A. Is this one of the cameras you were talking about right here on top of the garage? Yes. And was there any more here? Above the front door. Okay. Come on up. Feel free to stand up, stretch, ladies and gentlemen. Remembering obeying three of the four cardinal rules. No research, no discussion, an open mind.
I'm just discussing with you the outside cameras, not, not to inside, okay? Correct. Because right. inside you said there was a screen, not a camera, but a monitor with, you could see five cameras, right? Yes. I don't see any pictures here of the actual front door. Did you take close-ups of the front door? Yes. We saw your video. Do you remember seeing the... On your video, do you remember seeing the camera at the front door not facing outwards? It was facing towards the house? Yes. Does that look a little odd to you, that someone would have a security camera and it's facing to the house? Yes. Did you take fingerprints off of that? I did not. Uh, fingerprints uh, would possibly, you can compare that if there was a latent print. How would you do that? Would, would, how do you do that? How do you take fingerprints or try to? Depends on what the surface is. You remember the surface on the camera above the door? <clears throat> Some kind of resin, I assume. All right. How would you take fingerprints if you tried to? With mag or black powder. All right. And then you brush it on to see if you get a ridge detail? Yes. Then you could possibly match it up to someone who you have a standard that you knew that what fingerprints they really had. Well, someone else would do that, yes. Sure. I mean, you're not an expert now. You're only an expert in taking or trying to get prints off of something, right? Yes. Okay. And you can also swab something for DNA like a camera, right? Sure. What's, what's swabbing for DNA? What do you do? How do you do that? We use, well, our department, our process is we use sterile cotton swabs, which are basically Q-tips. Um, moisten them with distilled or sterile water, and then you rub the swabs, your moistened swabs, against whatever substrate you're processing. And your knowledge when you do that, you have a DNA lab at the sheriff's office who can tell, tell us if somebody may have left their DNA on an object? If their DNA is present on an object. Do that, you would have to just take a standard like a swab of their mouth, right? For a comparison, you, you've taken standards, right? Sure, so this way you can see if they match up to an unknown or DNA that's on an object to see if that person who you took the swab from touched that item, right? Correct, okay. you didn't do that in this case, no, nobody asked you to do that, no. So you, uh, 50, states 54C, you said the camera was up here? Yes. Two cameras or one? I believe there were two. Okay. Facing different directions? Yes. So when you arrive to this house, when you're outside the home, you don't know if you're being recorded, do you? Correct. When you got to the front of the house, you don't know if you're being recorded. Correct. While you were in the house watching the monitor, did you think the, it was, the DVR was recording everything? I wasn't watching the monitor. Well, you got a picture of it. You saw there was five different cameras, right? For documentation purposes, I wasn't staring at the monitor. No, of course not. But, but you saw there was a live view of five different cameras from the outside, right? Well, there were five different camera views. I don't know if they were li how last they were live. So, well, they were I'm live when sure. you were in the house, weren't they? Well, there were views on the monitor, yes, and there were five camera views uh, from exterior cameras. I know you weren't staring at it, but if you would look at it, you could see what's going on outside from inside the house, right? If they were working and timed correctly, I guess one could, but I didn't view it in that manner okay, so for documentation only. All right, so you can't tell us if, if, if I'm in the house as a law enforcement officer at three o'clock in the morning and I look at the screen, can I see who's coming to the front door? Well, I wouldn't see the front door because it's facing the wrong way, but this camera here, if it was working. Well, there was a ring next to the front door as well. But you didn't have access to that on the monitor, did you? I don't know what the monitor specific views. I know there were exterior camera views. Okay. So what I'm asking you, let's say these cameras, for instance, if you're in the house, can you look at the monitor and see what's happening outside live? Or you don't know. That's okay if you don't know. Well, what was on the screen when I photographed it was outside live? I can't tell you. So, okay. No one asked you to check that, right? 
No, I wouldn't be pulling that information off media. All right. Well, if you're there, couldn't you tell if another police officer is walking around the house or outside rather? Again, I don't know if they were live or if it was frozen, and I'm not monitoring the monitor. I have a job to do, which is to photograph and start collecting evidence. I'm not looking at that screen. Sure. I don't want to belabor the point, but nobody asked you to do that, to check if you could see a live view of what's going on outside. No, that wouldn't be part of what they would ask me to do anyway. Who would do that if it was important? Well, we have uh, a unit in violent crimes that deals with all media extractions from cell phones to DVRs. Okay. I'm going to say 53E. 53E. Said there was another camera face in the backyard? Yes. You never went in the backyard area, did you? No. So if there's little chickens there or pigs or anything, you don't know, right? No. Okay. And where was this camera? It's kind of hard to see. Was it on the seat? It's at the corner. It's, fake, it's facing the back, backyard, so it's actually the exterior south face of that residence, which is facing the backyard, but it's the west, extreme west corner of it. Okay. Would it be up here, like this area? Yes. Okay. What, what's this on the, uh, this outdoor patio? That's a camera. And what's up here? Well, there's two. One on the corner okay. there, and then the, I guess that's a porch, so the cover or roof of the porch. Okay. You didn't, you didn't collect the DVR that was behind the screen, did you? No. Who did that, do you know? If you don't. Detective Pycheck. And who is he? He's a homicide detective. Do you know why the people from the computer division, like you mentioned, didn't come out and do that? Sometimes they're asked to respond, and sometimes the a detective will collect media instead of crime scene because they can directly deliver it to the techs and the detectives that are going to extract information. With me, if I collected a DVR or any form of media, like cell phones, um, it's a process for me to document, package, and ultimately get that information into evidence so that the correct techs have access to it. So it's just a straight line from point A to point B if a detective takes media that needs to be downloaded later instead of waiting for me to be able to get to it. Is there a way to specifically remove the recording device? Make sure the evidence on it is preserved? You're asking the wrong person. I don't know. That's why y'all have experts there to do that, right? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. You know, if Detective Pycheck is one, an expert in, in media collection. No, but it's not, it's, it's not out of the norm for a detective to collect a media device from a cell phone to a DVR to a computer to a laptop. You know if he's an expert is my question. I'm sorry, no. Okay. You remember seeing a red light on the DVR indicating it was possibly recording when you when you photo? I know you just quickly looked at it and you weren't studying. At this time, I don't recall. Okay. Are you States Exhibit 35? 35A. Is this the ring 
camera that you re refer to? Yes. Emma, you refer to? Yes. Oh, okay, we have to make sure it's recorded. Thank you. And that would be, how would you classify it? If I'm walking to the front door, it would be to my right? Yes. A few feet up off the ground? I'm sorry? A few feet up off the ground? Yes. Do you know if this camera was working? I do not. Do you know if there was a doorbell as part of the ring? Was there a ring doorbell? I'm assuming they're one in the same. I'm not sure. Okay. Did you ever check if the doorbell was working by any chance? I did not. Okay. Was this the night owl camera that we talked about that was facing not facing towards the home? Correct. Okay. Were there any other cameras in this area? No, not around the front door. How about the ceiling mount and then the ring? All right, so we knew there was one to the south side of the front of the house, right? Yes. One in the center. Yes. By the door. Was there any to the, now this would have been north actually, right? North is this way, so we are, you're facing the front door, you're south. Okay. So to your right would be west and left east. Okay, so, so to my right is west? Yes. There was a camera to the west? Yes. Um, thanks for the correction, would there be a camera to the east? I believe there was one at the far east corner of the residence. Okay, was that facing the right direction? Well, meaning right direction facing out to the street. Right. Where most people would put it. Right. All right. And the one on the west, was that facing out directly to the grass or street area, driveway? Uh, the one on the garage? By yeah, the garage? that one. That was more oriented to the driveway, so it's like maybe not true north, but northeast-ish. Okay. Do you know if those cameras light up when they're on? Like the outside, if I'm walking by them, do I, can I tell they're on? I don't know. I don't remember. Now let me go back to 35B. Does that look like a doorbell to you? If, if you know from the ring camera. That's the ring, yes. You know if that's a doorbell too or you don't know? I don't know. If I show you the picture, would that help or you don't, you wouldn't know? Well, I don't have a ring, so I don't know all the components oh. and the doodads that come with it. So. Gotcha. Okay, 35C. And this was the monitor you're referring to? Yes. And you see five different screens, different split screens? Yes. Okay. Did it appear to be working or did it appear to not be working? Or you don't know? I don't know. Okay. The cell phone, the cell phone that the prosecutor put in at the end that you said was uh, Travis Rudolph's brother. Remember that one? From his bedroom. Right. There was only one phone in his bedroom, right? And I believe there were two on his dresser. I thought that's what you said in, in your direct testimony. You said that. But then we only see one in evidence. Do you know where the other one is? No. Well, then I only collected the gray iPhone. Why only one? It, maybe it wasn't in play, and it, the detectives didn't know just take the gray one. I don't know if they were able to differentiate ownership or not, and that's the reason I don't know. Okay, you took the best one that, according to what the police told you, may be involved in this case? Yes. All right, do you know if that phone was ever checked or dumped or, or whatever, downloaded? I don't know for sure, but I think it's a, it's a certainty. All right, it would, it's a certainty that it should have been done, right? I'm going to say it was all, all of the, the cell phones. Um, I'm pretty certain that downloads were done. Why do you think that? Because of the type of investigation it was. Okay. So, if, okay. But you don't know for sure. You're just saying it should have been. Correct. Okay. No doubt about that in your mind. In my mind, no. 
Uh, you, 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 go, you go to homicide. Unfortunately, in Palm Beach County, you go to homicide scenes probably a couple of times a week, don't you? Or at least yes. once a week. And are phone evidence becoming very, very important in most homicide cases? They're very important in every case that they're available. They hold a lot of information. Are you familiar with the triangulation where they could possibly tell where a person was? Yes. Uh, at the time there, the incident occurring? Yes. And where they made the calls from, possibly? Yes. You know anything about if calls are erased, if it would pick them up on, on the downloads, or you wouldn't know about that? I'm not sure about that. Okay. Remember some football paraphernalia in Mr. Rudolph's room, like a football and a football helmet from the Giants? Do you remember seeing that? Yes. And you actually, I can show this to you, but do you remember, you remember on photograph number L, the letter number L and 35L, was it, that the TV even had a football channel on? I'm going to show you. I know it's on, but I just don't know what was. My approach to it? You may. What the information, what channel it was on. Football information on the car one at the bottom. Um, I can't make out what channel it is, though. Want to see the Raider sign on the bottom? I'm sorry, what sign? Raiders. You know the Raiders? The yes. Oh, so it looks like he's watching some kind of football show. It could be. I don't know if he's streaming that or if it's a network show. I have no idea what channel it is. Okay. It just says football information on it. That was on when you got into Mr. Travis's room, right? Yes. Okay. You didn't change the channel? No. Of course not. <laughs> no time to watch something else. Oh. Of course Bravo, not. Bravo, TLC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then there's some uh, pictures. <laughs> It was on the bed in, in Travis's bedroom. Okay. This, this phone, was it cracked? I'm sorry? Was it cracked? Was it broken? Cracked. Oh, the screen. I'll have to check my, my report for a better description. Yes, atop the bed, the black Apple iPhone with a cracked screen. May I approach the witness? May. Do you, do you want gloves to open this uh, cell phone up? No. <laughs> They're going to give it anyway. Thank you. You watching? Yes, ma'am. So that was professional, does this? I don't want much better than me. Do I have to chew it open or can I have some scissors? <laughs> Need some scissors? You got scissors? There you go. This is Shiner. Yeah. Er Thanks, Mike. Thank you, all. up so we can see it please
I, I can't tell it's cracked. Where is it cracked? Up the top. The radiating fractures down here to the front face. I'm sorry. Can I publish to the jury judge? Yeah, sure. Right, can I borrow that? Thank you. Do you want close? You can take the gloves off. I probably won't show you anything that you may need them. Promise? Wow. All right, that phone that we just we just saw, um, did you try to see if it was working? No, but I manipulated it in order to photograph it, and usually if it's on, the screen will light up. Okay, because we saw pictures of the phone that was in the trunk with the tennis screen. Remember that, the red yes. phone? Yes, yes. And that we can see there was a whole bunch of writing on there. Remember that? Yes. All right. So normally if you move the phone, if it's working or on. If it's on, that will activate the screen saver and it will come on. You, you don't know that phone got cracked or broken or whatever condition it's in, do you? No. All right. Let me show you 53. Oh. No, that's that's correct. Uh, how big would you say the monitor is in the in the living room area? Rough estimate. Um, maybe thirty-two or smaller. Thirty-two inches or smaller. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> And behind it, would that be, to your knowledge, the DVR that records or doesn't record, whatever? That's the DVR, yes. And DVR means that's what is supposed to record, so the recording yes. device? Yes. And maybe this is just the shadow or not, but there's red dots here. Do you know if that means it's on or you wouldn't know? And I can show you the picture if you need to see it better. I believe you. I just don't know what that's indicative of, if it's live recording or not. I don't know. Did you find out subsequent to weeks later that the cameras weren't recording according to the sheriff's office? I'm not aware of that. Did you find out they were recording? After the, if they downloaded the information, I wasn't made aware of it. Okay, so you don't know the results, if it was working or not? No. Okay. And you and you collected photographs with the with the cameras and the guidebook on how to work it, right? Yes. And where where did you find the letter R and Q is a password, right? Yes. Where, where where did you find the the guidebook and things like that? That information was in a uh, Travis Rudolph's bedroom. You know where? Roughly, like in a drawer? Was it out? No, I believe it was that and other information that was pulled was in a, a nightstand drawer next to his bed. All right. Was it his bed or the mom's room? or you, you, you No, his bedroom. Okay. Yeah. All right. And 53S. What's, this phone case is to what? It's part of the phone case. Um, I don't know if it originated. I don't know where it originated from. If it was part of the the what was on the phone on the bed or not. Was this in in the brother's room or in Mr. Rudolph's room? Travis Rudolph's bedroom. Okay. See, so it was it was already off the phone the time you you got there, right? It was there when I started photographing this scene. All right. So would you assume this based on what you saw was this? case originally or because it fit that phone that we saw that's cracked yes and there's no case on that phone right no the one that you have in evidence correct you 
you were shown some photographs. Uh, look, I don't know if the letters looks like C and V. Another one, let me show you another one. And then also E. This is on top of Mr. Rudolph's closet? Yes. All right, so it's obvious he didn't uh, try to take this gun and throw it down a sewer, right? Well, I don't know if that's obvious, but this is where it was when I documented it. Okay. You, you, you didn't have to go on a roof to find this gun, did you? Correct. You didn't use any drones to find it, right? No. You just walk right in. It's right there. That's where it was located. Yeah, you, you could see this. It wasn't hidden, right? No. And it was actually made safe. There was absolutely no bullets still in the gun when you observed it, right? Uh, there were no bullets, and there was no magazine. Okay. So this gun was made safe when law enforcement came in there was no you didn't have to get anyone to remove the magazine or take any bullets out of the chamber right well any firearm that is discovered on any scene is checked anyway for safety by a law enforcement officer and that was done by detective pie he confirmed there was nothing in the chamber and there was no magazine and that's a smart thing to do when you know the police are coming to your house to, for a shooting and you just use that gun, right? Take the bullets out, right? I'm supposed to respond to that now. Oh, I, you think it's I've never had to hide a gun from the police, so I don't know what no, but all the moving parts are when you're going to do that. Course, so I don't you've know. Been, you've been to a lot of crime scenes, right? Yes. You don't always see guns right out in the open where someone's accused of killing another human being, do you? Choose. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Yeah, sometimes people discard them, they hide them, right? Sure. Yeah. Even sometimes you got to dig in closets, right? Sure. Open up safes. Look under beds. Anywhere a mind can deviate. Sure. People can do it. Absolutely. Okay. And when you found the drum in, uh, that holds 100 bullets, it holds 100 bullets, right? That's true. That was in the brother's room, Daryl Rudolph. Yes, under the bed. All right. Completely on the other side of the house, right? Yes, opposite ends. Okay. And it wasn't completely under the bed. You said you, you, the protos, you could see it partly sticking out, right? Well, that was after it was found. <laughs> okay. So did you pull it out? Yeah. The, uh, the detective who discovered it, um, when he looked under the bed, he pulled out the edge of it so that it could be photographed before being completely removed. It wasn't covered by a blanket, was it? Not that I'm aware of. There was nothing. Uh... It was just covered by the bed. Sure. And if you look under the bed, it's right there. Sure. Okay. So your BB, 53, BB. Tell me if you agree. Your testimony is that's where the other firearm was, the FN? Yes. And was it a holster? Yes. You know if this has anything to do with this case at all? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. You just took it and photographed it because, hey, you never know, right? Correct. Any gun may be involved in a homicide case. So you wanted to make sure. Correct. You can't go back a month later. Well, maybe you could, but it'll be much harder a month later if you find out this FNN had something to do with this case, it would be too late to go back and possibly collect it if someone hid it from you, right? Correct. Oh. Then you were showing a lot of pictures of the actual firearm, right? The actual firearm, the... The, the FN or the SIG? I'm getting to it. I'm a little slow. Sorry. The 223 SIG. Yes. Showing you 
is face exhibit number three. Is this the uh, firearm that you collected in the home? It is. Okay. You may. Oh, sure. Yeah, you will be able to see that later, but. Face exhibit number three. This is legal as far as you know, right? I would defer to others on that. I'm not an expert. That's correct. All right. How about the uh, the FN firearm? You know if that's legal? As far as I know, but I don't know that for sure. Right. How about the drum? Do you know if that's legal to have? Don't know for sure. All right. Nobody made you aware that this is any illegal firearms in, contained in the house, did they? No. You also said that Mr. Rudolph had a carry concealed weapons permit. Yes. You said CZW, but does that mean a permit? Yes. A lawfully carry concealed? To carry a concealed weapon, whether a gun or other. Okay. In the boxes and in the information that you found in the bedroom, was there any guidebooks on how to work these firearms as well, owner's manual? I'll have to check my report. I'm not sure. That was in the nightstand. All right. Well, that was found in Mr. Rudolph's house, right? Yes. States of 53W. But it wasn't in a gun box. Oh, okay. No problem. What is this? It says owner's manual, right? Yes. So this wasn't, and you saw the boxes with my client's name on it. Mr. Rudolph's name had, his, on, at least on the one of the boxes that we saw earlier, his name was on the box, right? Yes. Even had the date when he probably bought it, right? Yes. Well, these guns weren't like from the street at all, right? As far as you can tell. I don't know that for sure. All right, but do you usually see boxes and manuals from guns bought hot off the street? Sustained. <clears throat> you don't know anything about hot guns or buying them off the street, you don't, right? You don't know that. If these particular guns were or? No, any in general, you, you can't tell, right? No. Okay. The other police officers do that kind of work, right? Yes. Okay. 53XX. That's the one you said it had Mr. Rudolph's name? Yes. And PUs, does it probably mean pickup or you don't know? I would think that's what it means, yeah. And 11-29-2017? Yes. And this was the FN handgun that was in the holster in the drawer? Yes. Okay. There was no children living in that home as far as you can tell, right? Not that I'm aware. Teak, right? At 550 Teak? Not that I'm aware. Is there any children's clothing or toys and things like that? No. Do you remember seeing a, I know it's been a long time, but any kind of bags in Mr. Rudolph's bed? Bag. Training bags that somebody maybe take, take with him to train to a gym or something like that? Not that I recall. Okay. Fifty-three LL. 
These are the two phones you talked about earlier that were from Mr. Rudolph's home? Yes. In and I mean DJ or the brother's home, I apologize. In his bedroom, yeah. Bedroom, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Which one did you take, this one or, or this one, or can you not tell? The gray Apple iPhone. It would be the one? Oh, I can't tell from ah, okay. when it switch. Does it have silver edges on it? You don't know. I don't recall. Let me show you the phone. Okay. You may. Sonia states number 70. Am I taking this out? Any closer? If you, if you, any closer? No, am I taking it out of the evidence bag? Well, I just want, well, I want you to peek in there and tell me which one it is so you can match it up in there. You, I don't want to waste time with putting clothes on. Okay. Any gloves to peek in there, huh? <laughs> Better safe than sorry. Thank you. Oh, jeez, don't show him that. Okay, can you? A little disappointing. <laughs> I mean, it, this this one has a cover. Right. So. Which one is it? Can you? In its or? cover, there's no silver exposed. Okay, so I'm thinking I'm going with right. Okay. Because there's no shiny element on the perimeter of the phone. Gotcha. And do you know if this phone turned on at all when you moved it? I believe it did. The screensaver activated. All right. And this phone here, uh, I know you can't remember, but you, from the best of your memory, someone told you it had nothing to do with the case or it wasn't working? Well, I didn't collect it, so which is not known because I collected every cell phone I came across. Um, so I must have been told it wasn't in play. Okay. All right, thank you. Actually, your memory is excellent because on triple N, this is very safe exhibit. You took a photograph of the phone, the front of it when it when you moved it, right? Yes. You know, you, you didn't look at this phone to see if any of this had any relevance, did you? No, I didn't. That'd be something for the detective to do. Yes. Okay. And like you said, dump the phone to find out everything that's in that phone, right? Correct. Triple V, stage 53, triple V. And I think this is also in evidence. Remember seeing the box that you identified? Yes. You didn't see it. It was in the bag, but you knew what you put in there. Yes. Okay. No crime having live ammunition in your house, is there? No. You could have a million bullets if you want them, right? Yes. I think in one of the pictures you said there was three different kinds, manufacturers? Yes, there's five head stamps represented in that photograph, but um, in the processing of them, I determined there were three different makes. Nothing illegal about those, right? No. I'm sorry? No.
talk about what you found in the black catalog. Did you take pictures of every defect? Pretty much you did, right? Well, that many defects, I'm not real sure I got them all. Um, but the ones that were obvious and to the best of my ability, I, I labeled and photographed. Okay. And we didn't talk about the outside of the car. Um, would you agree there was one spot on that car that had blood-like substance? Yes. And that would be on the left driver's rear quarter panel? Yes. You, you didn't see photographs of those, did you? Yes. You did? Yes. And it was labeled BLS? I did. Are you asking if they were the photos were published? Yes. I don't believe they were published here, but they do exist. I photographed it and labeled it. And okay. And I'm going to use this little diagram. Sure. <clears throat> Feel free to stand up and stretch, folks. Judge, I'm just going to interrupt briefly to indicate an agreement between the state and the defendant um, to enter uh, states 13, uh, just diagrams of the defects on the Cadillac. Very well. Submitted without objection. Do you agree it was back here in this area? Yes. And I don't know if this particular car I had a gas tank here because they're all different, but um, did you take measurements or do you have an opinion about how far it was from the back seat to where the blood was in the back? I did not take measurements. Uh, approximating maybe two feet. Okay. And did you take a sample of that blood? I did. Why, why would you do that? Because it's evidence. Right. Maybe important to figure out how it got there? Yes. Or who the owner is. I'm sorry? Or who the owner is. Okay. And how about the pattern? Did you take specific pictures to see if it was flatter or it was just a drop? It was more than a drop. There were, there were several drops. Um, and they were photographed. All right. Do you know about blood spatter? Have you seen that before in multiple cases you've been involved in? Yes, there's all types of spatter. Could you tell if this was like spatter that came out of a body because something happened to a person, or could you tell if it was just a blood drop or, or no opinion? I'm not an expert in pattern interpretation. Okay. So no, no opinion about that? No. Are there people who can do that? Sure. But seeing the blood here, did it look fresh? In other words, did it look like it was there? Well, it wasn't wet. It was dried. Well, you got and it was still red. Okay. So to me, that indicates it didn't have age on it because then it starts to turn brown okay. after several hours. So, who, who would determine if this is going to be tested, this blood? Would that be the lead detective? Yes. Not you? No. Okay. And the rest of the car, I mean, we, I know you mentioned all the defects. There was no other blood on the exterior of the car. No, not that we found. All right. How about the interior in the back seat? You didn't mention on direct any blood that was in the back seat. Well, on the, the areas facing the back seat, which would encompass the, the headrest of the front passenger seat. Okay. Um, and the same for the driver's seat, there was small areas of blood-like staining on the backs of those areas. 
and I believe there was just a small amount of, of a blood-like stain on the right rear passenger seat. Did you put a blood-like BLS sticker and, and take photographs of that? No. Did you collect it? No. All right. How come? It's my opinion. I don't know for sure, but I, it's my opinion that we knew who was in the vehicle. We have all the people that had occupied that vehicle at some point during the shooting, so there wasn't a need to identify the origin of the blood-like stains. Okay. So do you, do you know, as you sit here today, if that blood came from a man named Tyler Robinson versus the decedent? That I don't know, but it's my understanding that Robinson didn't make it to the vehicle. That's what you were told by law enforcement officers? Yes. Sustain. Did you use that knowledge in determining what you were going to collect? The fact that Mr. Robinson didn't make it to the vehicle, I'm not offering you for the truth, Judge. I don't know if you want me to argue that. Did you use that knowledge to determine if you were going to try to find evidence of Mr. Robinson's blood inside the car? No. And then why Maybe did, I don't understand the question. Yeah, that's a bad question. I'm sorry. Right. I didn't use the fact that there was uh, there were blood-like stains in the rear passenger compartment of that vehicle to determine what I collected or documented inside that vehicle. I'm asking about Mr. Robinson. You said you received information from other officers. Stain. I didn't even ask the question yet. Well, it was the same question that you just said you were going to ask her the same question that you've already asked. You may. Feel free to stand up and stretch, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat>
Help there should be another photograph of, of the other phone. Yes, I can do and that. And it's, it's screen. D. Do you see that or is it too far? I can see that doesn't tell me which one it is. There was a loose one and then there was one in in the satchel. Let me show you the other phone. N. The other phone. I'm, now I'm confused. I'm showing you the pictures. Yeah. I'll show you all the pictures of the phones. See? Maybe this one. There's a lot of pictures. How about each? Uh, the 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 red Apple iPhone was laying on the floor of the trunk, okay. and the blue Apple iPhone was inside. The satchel. Okay, so this is G. Is that the red one you're referring to? Yes. And that's H. Is that the front of it? Yes, that would be the front of the red phone. Okay. So the phone that was in the satchel that we had identification of the decedent, Mr. Gene Jocks. That would have been in his bag, right? Not this one, the other phone. The blue one. Was in the bag with Mr. Was in the satchel. And, and, Mr. and the decedent's ID was in there too, right? Yes. Okay. You, you didn't investigate any of these messages, did, did you at all? No. You don't know who Ghost is or Roxy or TY is, do you? No. Or boarding a flight to L.A., your boarding pass available. You don't know about that, do you? No. Right. So two phones in the trunk. Yes. Right? You, you don't know who belongs, who belongs, who owns this phone, the one with the tennis rackets on the screensaver. No, no if that's the blue one, um, you can guess that it's... Uh, that is seen because his ID is in there, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Well, let me show you these photographs. This was the decedent's phone, right? Yes. Well, it was in the satchel with his ID. Of course. That will be for the police to determine who the owner or who used that phone, right? Yes. The detectives. Yes. And you would suspect they would clearly try to get into that one as well, so we could see what was. I would think that would be part of the investigation, yes. Every phone. Every phone involving this case. My opinion, yes. You see the uh, tobacco paper you talked about? Yes. So does that look like this was in the this bag in the, with the deceit and stuff? Yes. Okay. So this, this is different than the phone with the tennis rackets, right? Yes, that screen is, yes. Okay, so this phone is more consistent belonging to the decedent because it's in his bag with his identification. Correct. Yeah. So three total phones found in this uh, black Cadillac. Yes. You don't know how the phones got in the trunk of the, of the black Cadillac, do you? No. Dates 36, 8 through M. Photograph L, as in Larry. Is this consistent with someone picking up a rock or a boulder and raking a window? It could be a bat, a stick. Okay. You have no idea who broke this, do you? That would be a crime if somebody got caught breaking another human being's. Um, 
may be true, but I'm going to overrule the objection. Go ahead. Answer the question if you know the answer. So it would be a crime to somebody break another person's window if they didn't have permission, said it right? could be. That's obvious then. Yes. <clears throat> you don't know who broke it, do you? I do not. Nobody checked this car for any DNA or anything that possibly could have done this. No way to do that, right? Well, no way to tell. I would say there's no way, but it wasn't done. All right. But how would you possibly check who did this window if there wasn't a video or a witness? How would you how would you do that? The only thing left for me is is latent processing and DNA swapping. Okay. No one asked you to do that, right? No. You know if that's Mr. Rudolph's car? I'm sorry? Did you find out the car with the broken window is Mr. Rudolph's car, Travis Rudolph? I don't believe I was informed of ownership. I don't know that for sure. Showing you photograph uh, 36 I state's exhibit. Identity evidence. It's the black shirt that you found in the front of the yard. Yes. Size large. Yes. Anybody check DNA from the neck or in the shirt to see whose it was? I don't know if that was submitted for DNA analysis or not. But again, any request for DNA or follow up analysis would come from the lead detective. Okay. But you collected it? Yes. Oh, and you put it in evidence and it's here today, right? Yes. Okay. You're in your notes, isn't it true that it was a cold or a cool evening that night? Yes. All right. what, what's cool mean to you? I know Florida, cool means it's different than in New York. So what's, what's cool here? Cool for me is 55 degrees if it's Above that, I'm um, happy running around in shirt sleeves. Okay. So 55 degrees would be cool relatively in your, in your mind? No, cold. Cold. Yeah. How about cool? Cool, cool would be uh, starting like six, 65. would still be okay. Do you remember the temperature by any chance this day? Or no. No. Or this night? No. But you know it's reflected it was cool. Yes. Photograph of State's Exhibit 28, A through F. So you F first. And you testify this would be Mr. Gene Jock, the decedent's hand, and a badge put over him. Correct. Why is that? Why, why do y'all do that on, on these type of cases? Because if there's any uh, trace evidence that we don't know about, the bag is used to contain any debris that might fall from the hand as it's being handled and transported to the medical examiner's office. What, what's trace evidence? What does that mean? It could be anything from fibers to hairs, glass fragments, dirt, whatever the investigation might be probative as, as trace. Okay. Um, if somebody gets into a hand-to-hand -hand combat, is it possible to get trace evidence like DNA off somebody's hand? Sure, we can swap the hands. Okay. And how about the fingernails? Uh, are you aware that the medical examiner swabs into the fingernail and takes samples from that? Uh, they don't swab, they actually clip all of the nails. Why? That's part of the autopsy evidence that comes over to me. Why? Again, for trace. So if someone's in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you might find the other person's DNA or an unknown person's DNA? Uh, sure, it's possible. Okay, and, that, and that's why y'all do that? Yes. You don't know if any of that was checked in this case, do you? Was what? Any trace evidence collected and checked in this case? Yeah. I don't know if uh, analysis were requested specifically for that from the nail clippings. All right, how about for DNA? Do you know if any DNA was attempted from the decedent's hands or wrist? No. Well, I did not swab them, um, and once they get to the medical examiner's office, 
for postmortem, it's um, the detective can request that if necessary, um, and they can do it, or they can ask for one of us to come over. But I believe that was part of the process. Did, did, weren't you told there was a hand to hand combat in this case, or foot to foot combat, or something like that? Overruled. I'm not asking if that was true. I'm just asking if you were told that to see why you would collect the work like services. Were you told that? Yes. Why would you do that? Would you collect it? Swap the hands? Is that transfer to another human being? I need condition of the hands to <laughs> blood like stains present. It's difficult to. The substance like that present on the surface, it's difficult to get um, a separation DNA sample because of the contamination from the blood. All right. So you can testify this was the medical examiner's investigator, Mr. Lombosco. Yes. And why is he doing this? Just so you can get pictures? Yes, that's a typical standard photos that are taken of, of all decedents, no matter what the manner of death. Um, we do dorsal and palm side. All right. And you, you've seen rigor mortis, unfortunately, hundreds of times probably, right? Yes. How would you classify this rigor mortis? Is this minor, medium, severe? I don't know whether she does or not. Do you? No. Okay. Sustained. Was it relatively easy? Did the investigator, when you were there at Lenguasco, did they have a hard time moving fingers back? Yeah. <laughs> have you seen cases where the medical examiner investigator has to actually break fingers to move them back? Well, you don't break the fingers, you break rigor. Okay, well, I don't know how it works. It's, yes. So, uh, sometimes you have to use excessive force or a lot of force to, to open up somebody's hand? Yes. Not in this case? No. I'm just going to make sure I didn't miss anything. Thank you. Hold on. Did you ever, have, did you ever see uh, either Travis or DJ Rudolph at all that morning? No, I don't recall seeing them on scene. Do you agree that in this type of case, you mentioned the word intermediary target. What does that mean? Would you agree that the bullets hit the car and then once they hit metal, the bullets fragment? Yes. So once they go through several different iterations of themselves, sure. once they pass through a hard metal surface, and then depending on the type of ammunition, um, they will tend to break apart. And it, it, it keeps going at each level or each surface it goes through. And then you're left with nothing but bits of metal. All right. Do you know if uh, the people in this case that one got killed, one got shot, do you know if there was little fragments that hit them? Or you wouldn't know? As opposed to whole bullets. I think for uh, the deceased victim, uh, based on the viewing of his back, it was a combination of both. He had large, um, what I consider gunshot wounds, and surrounded by small, almost like burning areas, uh, where like hot fragments hit the skin, burned it, um, and then left. Well, your job as a crime scene investigator, are you, are you new, supposed to be neutral, or, or, or you generally work with the police and side with the police? Side with the 
police. I don't understand. All right, Detective Manley made an arrest for, for murder and three attempted first degree murders. So my question is, is your job supposed to be cold and neutral, or because you're getting your salary from the sheriff's office, you tend to decide with the lead detective and, and do what she asks you to do? No, that doesn't come into play when they're to document. The evidence actually speaks for itself, so I'm there to document, collect, and process evidence, whatever that is, and however the results turn out. All right, so in this case, did you see a broken PlayStation in the home in 550 Key Drive? I don't recall seeing that. Bricks, no, just the ground cover lights along the front pathway. Been knocked over by the t-shirt. Why do you keep using the word victim? You don't know who the real victim in this case is, do you? From a legal standpoint? Well, this is the information that I was given on scene. And I need that information in order to fill out my paperwork properly, including the proper receipts. So this is the identity that was given to me by detectives on scene. I'm asking for a victim. I'm asking for a suspect. And there are times when I ask you, it, it's okay to list this person as a suspect or don't list them at all because they're just a person of interest at this point. So I identified them as I was given the information and seen. You don't know in this case that the person you think is the victim is one of the people who started all this or, or, or my client was acting in self-defense. You don't know that, do you? No. There's no way of knowing if, if the decedent in this case or the victim, as you call him, had a gun pointed at my client and his brother. You don't know that. I don't know that. Or if Mr. Tyler Robinson had a gun pointed at my client and his brother, you wouldn't know that either. That's correct. You can't say whether that's true or not true based on your investigation. Correct. Both Mr. Dean Jock, the decedent, and Mr. Robinson, you can't say either one of them whether they had a gun or not pointed at Mr. Rudolph. Both Mr. Rudolphs. I cannot. Fifty-four. Page fifty-four has been entered into evidence. Well, what you mentioned earlier about uh, Redwood and the street adjacent to it, the sidewalk. I don't remember the name. Sorry. Uh, the one south of 550T was Stable Palm. Stable Palm. So what did you see in that area? Well, that area on Red Redwood near Stable Palm were the blood-like stains that I swabbed for CSI Ali. Right. I think you said number 40 was the first one? Yes. If I put it up, it's probably going to be too blurry. Do you remember it, or do you want to say it? I'll show it to you. No, I have my report. 40 was the first area I swapped. I don't think you see it on this one. Yeah, 40 and 41. That looks like 40 to you? Yes. Okay. I'm not trying to trick you. All right, so this, this would be the first area of some blood. Yes. You know if this was spatter, splatter, or whatever words you use? Or drops, or no way of saying. <coughs> Need some water? Right. <coughs> <coughs> Need some water? We can get you some. <coughs> Working on a cold. Sorry. Right. Uh, some of the. Um, blood-like stains that were deposited where I swabbed 
some was just an area of what looked like a 90 degree drop, which would mean somebody was stationary and dripping blood. Um, others are elliptical shaped, which means somebody may have been traveling as they're depositing blood dripping from some part of their body. It wasn't a spray, but number 40, so small, small amounts. Thank you. How about number 40? What do, you, what do you remember about that? Was that like somebody was standing there running? I think all of the years people people were moving. But the last um, area that I swabbed was more a uh, more 90 degree shaped, which means just more round. Okay. And usually those drops are indicated with somebody who was stationary or it slowed down. All right. Give me a break. This oil stain here, you know, if that's where the car made the U-turn, did it look like that when you were there? I don't know for sure. I am aware of sure. um, dark brown oily stains okay. photographed and documented by C.S. Ali, Ali at this scene. Sure. You know, do you know whose blood this is from the Stanchion 40? I don't know who uh, originated any of the, the stains. I don't know if they were set for further testing or not. You swab them to see if anyone can do that, right? Right. Okay. When you see blood in that picture, you don't know if the person who dropped the blood, you can't tell based on, on the stanchion and the blood if that person had a firearm in their hand, can you? That's correct. Was all of the gunshots coming into this Cadillac consistent with going from right to left? I can't determine that. Asked you or to your knowledge, anybody else in the crime scene at the sheriff's office or West Palm or anywhere else, to your knowledge, to go to a Mr. Keyshawn Jones' home to see if he had a firearm in the house? No. Y'all get search warrants all the time, right? To go into people's homes sure. or permission. So we give them permission. Hey, come home, check out what I have. Yes. You don't do that, the detective does that. Right. As a detective, what if we got a search warrant or permission to go to Mr. Jones's home? You obviously would have done that to see if there was any firearms if it was important to this case. Someone in crime scene would have documented that. Okay. To your knowledge, nobody took any photographs of someone named Dominique Jones to document any injury she had. But you didn't, right? No. You aware of anyone doing that from the sheriff's office? Or not aware of anyone else who did And I don't know if you did this or not, or the detectives don't me do this. Um, who would check the neighbors for cameras and um, doorbell ring cams and things like that beside? Typically, deputies would assist in doing a canvas, and the detectives would look as well. If it's in my immediate zip code where I'm documenting, um, I like to include that information. If it's in close proximity to my scene, I like to include that information in my scene photos. Um, but this time, I wasn't aware that there were any neighborhood cameras that I needed to take into consideration, so I did not document any. Okay. The other officers would have told you they go to this house to take photographs? If there was other cameras? Usually they, they do, if, especially if it was in close, close proximity to the scene. How about where the uh, Cadillac parked? I know you weren't there and the car was gone when you got there. It was in 40th and Broadway, but... Remember seeing a big oil stain across the street from that other photograph I showed you? Yes. And you know if any of the houses right near where that car was parked had any cameras? That I don't know. And you suspect they didn't, otherwise the deputies would have asked you to document them? Usually that's the norm. That's what happens.
when I approach her. Okay. Show you state's exhibit number 27. Presented into evidence as what was in Mr. Sebastian. It says contents of Sebastian's pockets and parentheses keys. Did you collect this? I did. Can you open that and show us, please? one of which has a Toyota insignia. Anything else? How would you describe the dimensions so the record's clear? Approximately. I know you don't have a ruler. Just a rough, a rough estimate. Yeah, okay. So the Toyota one is it's the key fob. Right. Um, and then an additional key. And I'm not sure what that's from. It's a door key. I don't know. Okay. We can put that back. I appreciate it. Thank you. See defense exhibit number five from the doorbell ring camera? No. When you saw the decedent, uh, you saw him obviously in the car and also on the ground, right? Yes. That's the decedent here in this photograph. Lying down with a white sweatshirt. You see his right pocket in this photograph? I do. Isn't it true that his pocket did not look like that when he came out of the car? Overruled. Isn't that true? It did not look like that, no. You, you don't know what's in his pocket or in the decedent's the pocket in this photograph, do you? Did you take photographs of the decedent's whole body when he was laying on the ground? Yes. And his, his pocket, his right pocket, looked nothing like in that photograph while he was standing up in, in defense of the five, correct? Overruled again. Correct. Right. <clears throat> That's all I have. Thank you, Your Honor. All righty. Um, if there is any redirect, how brief will it be? Okay. All right.
promised, I am assured that redirect shouldn't take longer than five minutes, so we'll double that, call it ten. Um, uh, now, the question is, how much time do you all, you've been very patient, I appreciate it very much. How much time do uh, you need, do you want for lunch? We'll start with an hour, is that good? Yeah, it looks like almost... Okay, now it's unanimous. All you got to do is wait long enough. Oh, there you go. Two votes for one. There. You go. Okay, so um, please, please, please be back here at 2:55. 2:55. Remember, to obey the four cardinal rules. You won't run out. You won't run into me out there. But if you run into anybody else from this trial, duck us. We'll duck you. Keep an open mind. No research. No discussion, even amongst yourselves. See you at 2:55. <laughs> In the interest of time while the jury is leaving, come on up. Is the ninth day, that's the tenth, that to me is two weeks. This is what you asked for.
one, two, one, two. Jesus?
finish this trial. <coughs> No need to wait for Miss Edwards to do your uh, redirect, do we? Did you get that? Whatever it was you were waiting for? Did you, did you bring up whatever it was they were waiting for? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Mr. Clousey has it? Or who has it? Miss Ellis. Oh, Miss Ellis has it. Okay, good. <coughs> Got it. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Are we uh, ready to bring the jury in? Okay. Let's bring them in. Thank you for your punctuality, folks. All right, everybody be seated. You may, oh, whoop, where is CSI Brandt? She's coming in. Okay. 